So my name is Anna Kegisten. I'm a doctoral student and I'm currently sitting in Addis Ababa where the International Family Planning Conference is ongoing. We have about 300 youth delegates from all over the world taking part in this conference and I've been taking the lead on all the youth activities going on and we have been able to sort of arrange a training for them so they're meeting now for two days to prepare themselves for taking an active role during the conference. So it's really exciting and I'm looking forward to see what they're up to during this week. So I've been at the School of Public Health for about two and a half years now. I came in as a master's student and transitioned into a doctorate. And what's really cool about this place is all the opportunities that arise. You can just walk down the hallway and sort of interact with both peers and, and professors. And you really need to sort of be in the moment and take opportunities as they come around. Um, and it was really my relationship with my advisor and working with him that sort of resulted in the opportunity to work on this conference and to take the lead on all the youth activities. And it's been great because I've done that a lot in the past um, in Europe, but never in the international context. And it's really why I came to Hopkins. So in addition to the research component, it's been a fantastic opportunity for me. And I think Hopkins is one of the few places where that's really possible. Good morning. Boy, this sounds kind of weak. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Wow, we're, I'm so happy to be here to welcome you today um, for several reasons, uh, but it's so great to see so many smiling faces and so many, so many folks that are happy to be here. We're happy that you're here as well. Not only am I here to welcome you, but I'm here to congratulate you. Um, you've gone through a very rigorous admissions process. Um, the letters, the, the, the challenges, the GRE scores, some, ta some taking the GRE again, some doing uh, what it takes to get in. Um, nonetheless, I want to take a second, I would join, ask you to join me in giving this whole group a round of applause and congratulations. <laughs> that might sound corny, but it really is challenging. Not everyone gets in, and it, it's a very, challenging and special uh, community. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the university community. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today and then introduce a colleague. But I think it's really worth taking a second to reflect on these things as adults um, to congratulate ourselves and move on, move, move forward. So speaking of moving forward, one of the things that um, we're going to really want to know here is, let me get a sense. Um, it's, you know, it's getting close to that April 15th date. How many of you have made a decision on whether you're coming or not, just to show of hands. Oh, it's looking pretty good, kind of good. <laughs> we got some people to convince, though, right? All right. Let me get one more sense of one thing. I was just curious. I was just asking in the hallway, how far are people coming? Because most, a lot of people I was talking to were mid-Atlantic mid bound. Any Midwesterners in the group? OK. Lacrosse is a strange game. I'm from the Midwest, too, <laughs> OK? All right, so how about West Coast? Okay, looking good. You know Deep South? Dirty, dirty. Oh, <laughs> Dirty South, wow, wow. My niece is a Southern convert. How about offshore, international? Okay, where from? Uh, London. London, great. Further, anybody further? I saw another hand though. Was... Saudi, Arabia. Saudi Arabia, all right. All right, I just, was just talking to you about my chance, my opportunity. I had to visit Riyadh last year. All right, well, welcome. I welcome all of you. Um, I'm so glad to see so many of you here. And part of our goal is to help you understand the community you've just been admitted to, the community that your future, um, the parts of your future can be part of here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the university. I'm Mike Ward. I'm Associate Dean of Student Affairs here at the school. And I've been here at, um, at the Bloomberg School for eight years. Uh, eight years and at the university for 14 years. This university is a really different place. I've worked at other universities, um, big and small, and this is a really unique place. And I think uh, President Gilman, the first president of Johns Hopkins, um, really kind of cornered what, what makes this so unique. And part of, part of what makes it unique is it's really all about the encouragement of research, the advancement of individual scholars. I mean, pushing people towards excellence, which is ultimately going to push the sciences and society towards that excellence. 
and our mission here is knowledge for the world, okay? That's what we're about. And I, I would say that it's a really unique university. The three major campuses, Baltimore, uh, Washington, D.C., and Montgomery County, but there are campuses all throughout the world, um, Nanjing, uh, China, and Bologna, Italy. Somehow I never get the assignment to go to Bologna. I've been looking for that one. So um, There are nine schools that comprise this university. Now each, you know, the first president also made the, had the expression of each boat on its own bottom. Each school is independent and it's really uh, a decentralized university. And some of the beauty uh, this, of this is that the people that you will see in your departments and programs when you talk to today really build, shape, and um, have key roles in what are in your degree program. So experts in that particular field are what shape your degree program. So it's not like you're in a university and somebody's telling you all these broad things and all these things. It's really people in the field that are most important to your mission. A couple of things that are important um, about this is when you graduate, you're going to want to find you know, everybody's going to want to get a job, right? And one big thing about this uh, university is it's, it's, its hands and tentacles are all throughout the state and all throughout the world. When you think about the level of uh, spots that, we, that you can touch down on throughout the world, projects, I know well over 70 countries, and I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more about that later, but the university and the hospital the state's largest employer. So there are lots of opportunities, internships, connections, collaborating, um, and a lot of this is finding a way to drive, drive these things. Um, uh, a lot of this is we have a lot of bright people is finding a way to make these things happen and make these connections. So I think I've done my duty. Part of my duty is uh, to talk about history. A dean is always supposed to talk about history. And the one brief thing I'll mention is that the school, this school is different from many other universities, or this university is different from many other universities, in that we are um, based on a German model. My friend from London, um, who just raised her hand earlier, is probably usually uh, the British model is more of a community base, a more whole person base. The German model is more uh, go study under this expert, this scientist. It's more driven towards the scientists in that way. It doesn't mean that everything is, uh, everything, absolutely everything is scientific uh, in, 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 in that, but it's a strong basis of who we are. So today, um, let's, there, were, there was a you know, sizable number, I would say maybe 40% of you, just from my head count, said that I'm going to come on board today, right? So we got 60% of you that we really want to uh, work on some pieces on this page here. Get all your questions answered. Find out the types of things that you need to know. Um, ask the questions. We'll have opportunities to talk to staff. We'll have opportunities to hear about services. You have opportunities to find, about, find out about your um, program and department. I think that's very key. We're one of the larger schools of public health, but I would say that many experiences make you feel like you're in one of the smaller schools because a lot is driven by that department base, that program base, and that's your home within a home. So with that being said, take the time to understand who we are and uh, what this is about, what this can be about for you, who you can connect with. Um, I always remark on the level of passion that students, faculty, and staff have about improving health. Um, it is incredible. So as you go on tours, as you talk to people, or you're in, uh, in uh, some of the meetings with the departments, make sure you ask the questions that will help you understand where the passions lie and who shares the passions that you have, because they're here. Our depth and breadth is um, just remarkable. So today, speaking of depth and breadth and just some of the things you get to hear, you get to hear from four different, well, actually, you can have the opportunity to choose uh, some of, from these lectures that are, that are here available. This is a small taste of what we're doing, uh, what we do at the school, but I think it's um, a really, it's really diverse, in some ways it's a really diverse group of people. I think it'll be a great, great opportunity to hear lectures today. You can see the lectures, I'm not going to uh, read through them for you here, but um, you can see what's available for you a little later today. And here are some things that are going on um, on the campus, uh, you know, just some things that have happened from time to time. If you read our website, you'll get to see what's, what's, been, what's been going on. Uh, M Health is still uh, going strong uh, these days and probably uh, something we've been ahead of the curve on um, as opposed to many other schools. But 
around the school in general, every day, or every week, I should say, we have hundreds of speakers and seminars. There are too many things um, for you to decide. So those of you, MB, MPH students, can you just raise your hand and see? Okay, MPH, I always like to warn you, there's a lot of things going on, and it's a, it's a very short period of time in the program. So be very strategic on what you decide to get engaged in. Whether it's you're gonna engage in um, academic activities like these centers that are being referenced here, or whether you wanna talk about student organizations and being involved. I think everyone should be involved and find their niche here, but be careful because there's a lot going on and your real commitment here is to your academics. These, this is just a slice of some of the student groups. The student groups ebb and flow, so sometimes the, the groups will, um, the groups basically evolve and there's always new groups that are coming on board. If you have ideas, we always welcome that. So at this point, I have the opportunity to, to welcome um, a colleague to the stage. I must say, um, it looked like he had Eagles football colors on on that, that, uh, that tie. But any Eagles fans? Okay, all right, You're, it's just the two of you then. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, I did ask about Midwesterners, any Bears fans? Oh, oh all right, all right, I, I hear Bears fans, okay, all right. Oh, I'm not asking about the Cubs, we can't do that, we can't do that, we can't go there. All right, that's bad. That was a low blow. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, my colleague, Dr. Burke, who's a former deputy commissioner of health uh, in the state of New Jersey and director of science research, you know, he's a, he's a guy that, um, that works with the heavy hitters in government and science um, and maybe, maybe in his own right one of the next big heavy hitters um, in, in that, not one of the next, but in the government world as well. But he's a professor here in health policy management as the director of the risk center. But the big thing I would say about him is he's someone that you'll see, uh, whether it be government local, government national, or at the state level. And he knows the who's who's list, and the people know him on the who's who's list um, around the country. Probably the biggest thing I think when I talk to um, Tom about his work that he's, he's most proud of is that students Students say that um, he is an outstanding teacher. They love his classes. And uh, I guess we'll give, a, give him an opportunity to give you a, a slice of why that's the case. So I'd like to, with no further ado, welcome my colleague, Dean Burke, up to the stage. Hi. So uh, I'm nervous. Um, and you might be too, but because um, I never, not, I'm not quite sure what slides they gave me. Um, they, re they, they really can't keep me on script here, so, uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but I just wanted to, I want to drill down on something a little. So Mike said uh, regions of the country and world, but uh, let's get specific here. Uh, anybody from Jersey? How you doing? Let's see. I also lived in Texas. Um, and you're from, so it's different. How y'all doing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I, so I, I have to tell you before I start my slides. Uh, I didn't get into Hopkins, so I, 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 I did my public health and my MPH down at the University of Texas. Not that it's a lesser school or anything, but, and I'm not going to dwell on my talk. I'm not going to dwell on what the number one school is. I'm just saying that right now. All right, but uh, anyhow, it's good to see so many people from Texas and Jersey. Because, because for some reason, when I went to the University of Texas, my colleagues called me Tex. I think they were bullying me or something. I don't know. <laughs> But congratulations, you got in. I know some of you might be nervous. We actually did see your organic chemistry grades. <laughs> you know, organic chem, how many of you enjoy organic chemistry? OK, there's always a few. <laughs> but organic chemistry, some of you perhaps didn't get an A in that. Uh, I want you to know it's responsible for more outstanding public health leaders than any other factor in the educational process. <laughs> Bad organic chemistry teachers. So I'm not reflecting on my own experience at all. Um, so I, I always, oh good, they could give me the good slides. Um, I don't know if my colleague in the booth can, can play this, but, but any of you recognize this movie? Okay. If you vote for me, all of your wildest dreams will come true. 
A lot of reasons. One is he's like wearing a wig, so, uh, which I'm toying with that idea. But, uh, but Napoleon Dynamite is, is actually a, I can dance just like Napoleon too, but, um, and you might see that in a certain video that's circulating around about our spring tonic tonight. But, um, but it, so when I think, like, what, what am I going to tell folks and how do I convince you to come here? And, and, I, and I speak from the heart on this. Uh, so I'm a kid from New Jersey City who, uh, you know, my parents didn't finish high school. And I'm a dean at Hopkins. And, uh, and I am working with the President of the United States on tough environmental issues. So in a lot of ways, Hopkins for me is a place where lots of dreams come true. But I'm not the real dean, so I'm speaking on behalf. <laughs> Be half of my clag, who it's amazing how mature he looks for someone who was born in 2005, but wouldn't you say? <laughs> I think that's a mislabeled slide. Labeling is important when you do scientific things. I'm an epidemiologist, so, uh, so but this is a, an amazing time to be in public health. Now I want to get a little bit serious. Think of the public health challenges we have around the world right now. Think of the public health challenges in your own community. Think of the worldwide recession that most of the world is not really coming out of, that local health departments can't grapple with. Think of the people without medical care. Think of the people without clean water. Um, think of the challenges we have in public health. This is the right place to be. We really do. And this sounds very boastful, protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time. It's not about the tuition. Um, it's, 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 it's actually about the way that we look at populations and the way that we have been able in public health, and by we I mean the field of public health, really does influence people's health in the millions. And, and you would think that sounds impossible? Not really. So, uh, so anyhow, public health is amazing, and, and I wanted to mention one thing. Mike said I'm working with the heavy hitters, and uh, you do get to do really cool stuff. So I, there are two things. So you know, I publish a lot of papers. I got tenure at Hopkins and things like that. But what what's really cool? Um, so two really cool things I've done in the past couple of years. My family seems to weigh one a little bit more than the others, and, and so I was actually on the Dr. Oz show. Uh, <clears throat> Some people think he's America's doctor. He's not. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a showman. And I'm telling you, confidentially, he went to the University of Pennsylvania, too. And I went there for my PhD in epi. Um, if you look real close at his hair, <laughs> we're, but we're the same age, all right? His hairline's not natural. <laughs> the color, a little tint of purple in there, all right? <laughs> My head on the other side, <laughs> that's natural Tom, <laughs> all right? We get to do cool things. But we also, as I mentioned, we take on society's most challenging problems. One thing about public health is it is not for the faint of heart. We go where the problems are. We go where the intractable problems are. Think about substance abuse in the inner city. Think about the intractable problem. And yesterday, again, we see such a national tragedy in Texas of how we grapple with gun violence and perhaps the very difficult combination of mental health and violence. And think about affordable care, the biggest debate in this country right now, which may de determine who sits in the White House the next time around. So we're there. I mean, we are working with the leaders. There you see our namesake. Um, well, Hopkins is our namesake. Michael Bloomberg is, is very important to the school and a real pioneer in public health and amazingly courageous in the issues he's taken on. We also have faculty who are taking on things that are not always popular. So LSA Oguayar is, um, so we, we don't have, another place I teach, which you got to try and do if, you, if you're here for a while, get over to Barcelona and take a, somehow I always, Mike doesn't get the good assignments, but I always get to teach in Barcelona, and, and, which has um, pretty cool beaches, but they don't wear enough clothes. Uh, <clears throat> that would not happen, that would not happen at the Jersey beaches, just saying. Um, but El Aseo has taken on a huge industry 
through his research, doing a systematic review to see, well, do all these mineral supplements make a difference? And the evidence is not there, all right? And let's face it, all of us have said, uh, um, like I tried a couple of minerals to see if I could regrow hair, it didn't work. Uh, <coughs> We take on the challenges, too. And what about jobs, right? Let's face it, I want to tell, if I have time at the end, I want to tell a little story about, you know, there's a joke like three priests walk into a bar and all that. Well, three public health graduates walk into a job interview. Who's going to get that job and what does it take? And you can see that this, uh, unlike many other professions, uh, our field continues to have high demand. I have to say it's it's been really good for my graduates in epidemiology, environmental science. These are intractable problems that do not go away, and we're providing the frontline workers to take them on. So when you think about this, or, or what, what awaits you here? Mike talked a little bit about the history, um, but I want to talk about today. Because this place for me, I have to tell you the truth, I, I thought, so I came down here from uh, being a health commissioner to Hopkins, and I thought, this is great. I had a real close attachment to this place as a wonderful institution. The surgeons across the street saved my life when I was a kid and patched my heart up. I was born with a congenital heart defect, so I literally think Hopkins is in my heart. I came down here, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have the bill. It was $600. Things, <laughs> things really change. <clears throat> um, but it's about the students. Under this amazing roof that we have, the diversity of students from around the world, from around the country, where people from Texas get along with people from New Jersey, <laughs> and people from Israel get along with people from Saudi Arabia, and we accept each other here. It's just amazing. And we work in the community and in the international community in a way that I think is, is unparalleled. And you're hearing from a dean of practice, even though this school was founded in the German model of the professor and, and the scientist and the mentoring, I'm all about getting outside the walls. Right? Because you're not going to change a community unless you're trusted by that community and you're out there in that community. So let's talk about the origins. All right. Now, I think we're videotaping this, so I apologize. But there's, there's our founder, the first dean. I call him Popsy. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple of statues around, and, and you know how in, in, uh, in, in it, anybody go to Notre Dame? Well, there's this tradition before a football game where they, or even if you go to the University of Maryland, they touch the Terrapin, and and, uh, and and so we touch Popsy Welsh's nose before finals. <laughs> when we don't have a great football team here at school. Um, <laughs> Established in 1916, before my time, before the great pandemic, but really focused on bringing together in that model public health practice, administration, training, and education, and, and, and really making sure that we had all the parts of a good public health education. Our mission, all right, which, again, saving lives millions at a time, it's, it's about discovery, so it's about research but it's also about application, and that's what I'm most proud of. I've spent a lot of my life studying environmental challenges, understanding exposure. I'm a risk assessor, understanding the risk to human health from environmental pollution, but I'm most proud of the work I've done to translate in, that into national policies. So we've had a lot of trailblazers. And I know sometimes you think, oh, here's the pictures of the old white guys, right? Um, yeah, but they were amazing. And the reason we're all here today and not sitting on a potty somewhere is because we have chlorinated water. <laughs> and waterborne disease is a rarity in this country. Unfortunately, it's not a rarity in many countries of the world. And it's a huge, huge killer. Diarrheal disease kills more kids than any other disease. Vitamin D, the discovery of the tremendous benefits and the necessity of vitamin D. And Rachel Carson, who really founded the movement, um, and, and Rachel Carson was an inspiration to me, wrote the, the famous book, The Silent Spring, about pesticides in the environment. And when I was growing up, we didn't have bald eagles in New Jersey. We didn't have large predatory birds. We had a lot of seagulls around the landfills in the meadowlands. Um, but um, 
an awful lot of the things that have become the, f the front lines of science were established here. Chronic disease epidemiology, Al Somer, our former dean, who discovered the incredible uh, value of vitamin A in preventing blindness and other childhood mortality causes, and cervical cancer, which takes a tremendous toll globally on young women, was linked to the HPV virus and is a preventable disease. These are things that happen here. We've got all kind of cool alumni, sort of generals, directors of, of PAHO in, in Latin America, health ministers. I have this, check it out, I have this podcast called Public Health on the Inside. I always wanted my own little radio show. So, so I get to interview cool people who went here and other people in leadership positions. And, and we have leaders, our alums. I actually think one cool thing about teaching, it's, it's really easy to teach here because people are great when they come here. It is like, I don't know if you listen to public radio, but there's this Minnesota program that talks about and all where the women are beautiful or I don't know, something, 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 and all the children are above average. Uh, you're all above average. We know you got in, except a couple of you in organic chemistry. Um, <laughs> but it's all about students, too. If you have a chance to hang around today and meet up with people in the current MPH class, they were asking me yesterday, Tell us the truth, Dr. Burke. This is the best class ever, right? And I said, yes, yeah. which I say once a year. Um, <laughs> but they really are. And, and, uh, and what's amazing about this is that by the end of your program, you have a network of colleagues that is lifelong. And public health, it doesn't work if you try to do it alone. It's about networks. It's about having colleagues you can trust. It's about knowing who the leaders are and working that network, and it starts with the students here. And then there's this mysterious, like, who's this guy? <laughs> Sometimes the communications office puts the funniest pictures in these slides. Uh, that's not really representative of our faculty, but it's, it, it's more like a little puppet show the guy's giving or something. But um, we have a lot of faculty. And they are on the front lines. And we are proud of the stuff we do, not only in the medical journals. We know nobody reads medical journals up on Capitol Hill. You got to go there and translate it. You have to explain things that maybe are evident to the scientists, like global climate change, maybe evident to the people living in coastal areas in Louisiana or the Jersey Coast or in other places around the world. Our faculty are amazing. And, this, and the ratio is great. And then there's the research that's going on all around the world. And we can't really keep this up to date. But you can see that we have outposts all over the world. Uh, many of the students who come here from around the world, who maybe had a hard time getting here today for Visitor's Day, know of us because they've been touched by our research. And I even get to go to cool places, all right? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever been to that building? <laughs> yeah. Was it a warm day when you were there, too? It was about 190 degrees there. <laughs> and they told me I couldn't really take a vehicle there. I, you have to either walk or, or get on that little cart that takes you there. I understand. I mean, it was a hot day, but what an amazing place. And my travels in India were just amazing. And the public health challenges there are enormous, including some things like chlorination. Now, I wasn't going to dwell on this. Well, I'm a numbers guy. I'm an epidemiologist. and, I, and so. Just taking one cross section. Some of you may be thinking of other schools in other cities, maybe thinking of how the weather is in Boston. But I want, I want to assure you that we have sunshine. No, actually, we have daylight. <laughs> Almost 300 days a year here. Um, but, take, but take a look. at it. We're good. All right. And when you think of the grants that we get, the research that we do around the world, uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit of comparison. So there are some other schools that are very good, um, but, but we're better. Oh. <laughs> what about today? Well, I talked to um, several of you. I, li I like to, uh, to actually come to the auditorium early, because I am actually nervous before I do this and see who shows up early. And, the, and, uh, and, and so there's a, uh, a man from Columbia who was the first one here today, so I want to give him a shout out. But he's, it's like uh, six in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, no, yeah, it's not. Um, but uh, we have 10 academic departments. I know 
and probably many of you are in, in different master's programs and different departments or doctoral programs, many different kind of certificates. I, I teach the risk sciences, which is essential for any public health practice person. Um, how do you make decisions about risk and how do you balance risk? But many different uh, certificates and, and, and uh, so many different kind of master's degrees, some of you MSPH, some of you MHA. Uh, there are very important differences in that. One thing that I'm going to warn you about, there's over 500 courses. So it's tough to figure out. Uh, most of you will have required courses, but you will have a lot of flexibility. You get to sample things. And I challenge you to go outside your comfort zone and learn things that perhaps you didn't think were important. It all comes together. Public health is absolutely transdisciplinary. So if you only focus on epidemiology, without understanding the social aspects of things, without understanding communication, some of the other core competencies. It's going to be a challenge out there. So we have a lots of cool things. And so there you see all the, all the cool. The coolest department, well, actually I'm appointed in three of them. The coolest three departments are environmental health, um, epidemiology, and health policy. But then the coolest international department is international health. The coolest mental health department is the Department of Mental Health. <laughs> Um, and our laboratory departments are amazing. So I, I, we're good. Now, I'm the dean for uh, public health practice. And what's that all about? It sounds like what you do before you're good at something, right? You practice. Um, but it's really all about translating our science to make a difference. That's an emerging, important trademark of an education here. You will have an opportunity to do a practicum, to get out there. For a lot of you, that means getting out of your comfort zone. You're going to see stuff you wouldn't believe. You're going to see communities that really are challenged by public health challenges. And you're going to work with faculty who are on the front lines. But get out there. So why should you accept us? Become a student here. Well, there's this old guy who's retiring called David Letterman. And a long time ago, I, his top 10 used to be big news every morning. Like, oh, what did he say last night? What did he say? So I'm an old guy. Um, and I want to tell you my top 10 reasons about Hopkins. All right. Well, the first, and, and it's the reason I am here, it's the reason I stay here, um, are your fellow students. There is a lifelong network that you will establish as a student here. And the students are phenomenal. And it's just great. The perspective that you get here, number nine, of science, practice, and policy, seeing how we go from the laboratory to the community, to Annapolis, to state policy, to Washington for national policy, to international policy through WHO and the United Nations. And then there's also the whole issue of mentoring. Right? Now, this is what the faculty really looks like. <laughs> But I, I give all the credit to my career, in my career, to my mentors. I have been very fortunate ever since really primary education of, of having great mentors. And I've had great mentors here. But having you can't just say, I want you to, you're famous, I want you to be my mentor. It's about giving back. So I hope you all get a chance to hear Dr. Edith Schoenrich, who is truly the dean, the most experienced person here, who's been my... Uh, Really, my, my, well, I hate to say this because I'm from New Jersey, but y you know, you have a godfather, you have a godmother. Uh, now let me just say she's, she's been somebody who, who has protected me from my edgy behavior sometimes and, uh, and being a practitioner among the world of researchers, terrific person. But also Don Steinwalks, who was a chair of my department when I got promoted to full professor, and I realized giving back. So they're having this uh, party and, and, uh, and the staff had given him a grass skirt and whatever those other coconut things are to wear. And I was the associate chair at the time. He said, Tom, put this on. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so your mentor tells you to do something and, and give back. And so there's a picture of me that's all around the world. And now as I struggle with Senate confirmation um, and, and, uh, and think about my White House, my pending White House appointment, um, yeah, this picture's around, so the FBI had some questions about it. No. <laughs> Getting back to the 10 top reasons, though. The academic offerings. I talked about 500 courses, but you need a toolbox. This is a competitive world. You need to come here and decide, how am I going to define myself as a public health professional? 
this is the place to do that. Right? You can craft a unique but strong set of competencies here that will enable you, when I get back to that story about the three public health students who walk into the job interview, enable you to excel. There'll be opportunities for practice, as I mentioned. The research is amazing. I've had a, a view from the front lines. One of the things, so I'm an environmental specialist, and I came through New Jersey. So New Jersey has some of the worst environmental challenges on earth. It's doing a really good job of trying to tackle them. There was a time when I was worried about people swimming off the Jersey coast when all the sewage plants dumped their sewage there. Not an issue anymore. All right. There's buried munitions down in Washington, D.C. Remember, a certain uh, other president was looking all around for weapons of mass destruction. Well, uh, unfortunately, we found our own uh, manufactured during the First World War that are buried in northern Washington. And how do you do that? Were well, you going to call? Well, I got the call. When FEMA was grappling with the challenge of the trailers and, and the health effects of the kids who were in those toxic trailers, I chaired a committee for CDC to try and study the health effects and change the way that we shelter people in the most difficult times. I also closed the Jersey beaches. That, you got to be good. You have to make tough decisions in public health, too. Then there's Baltimore. Life in Baltimore, you probably heard a lot of different things about Baltimore. It's actually a very cool place. Um, we're pretty good in sports. The O's are in town, and the season started. And if you're a Boston fan, all right, so we've split so far. But life in Baltimore is pretty good. Um, and the people are really friendly. And we're actually a pretty good school. I don't know if I mentioned this, but, but we are. Well, oh, I didn't mention it yet. <laughs> we are number one uh, and have been ever since I've been here. And, and I, just a correlation. <laughs> just a correlation. Um, but, you know, other schools want to be us. Um, and then I realized I had 11 things, um, so I have a point five here. <laughs> you will look cool in a Hopkins hoodie. There's no doubt about it. This is how Mike and I and, and, and the others really spend our time. But finally, I just want to say, if you come here, just like for me, uh, maybe getting back to Pedro Sanchez, your wildest dreams will actually come true, millions at a time. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Lower the mic a little bit. Um, I'm Leslie Vink. I'm the Director of Recruitment and Communications here at the school. And on behalf of Admissions Services, and we just wanted to congratulate you all um, on your admissions. Again, you're going to hear this like 500 times today, but I just want to get mine in quick. Um, but we're really excited. It's so nice to see um, some familiar faces and, and welcome you to the Hopkins community. Um, we do really hope that this day proves to be beneficial for all of you. Um, those of you who have accepted, um, this is your time to kind of feel what it's going to be like here. Um, and those of you that we have yet to convince, um, we hope that you get all your questions answered. Um, you will have plenty of opportunity to do that throughout the day. Um, and if by chance you still have questions at the end of the day, um, please find myself um, or Taryn Maloney, who's kind of running around, or anybody with a little visitor badge on, um, or not a visitor badge, a staff badge. We're happy to help you. We want, it, we want you to leave today with the tools that you need to make your decision. So I have the great pleasure of introducing our next presenter, Dr. Ruthie Fezahazian, an alumnus of the Bloomberg School and former recipient of our prestigious Hopkins Somer Scholarship, a first-generation daughter of Eritrean refugees who grew up along the U.S.-Mexican border. Ruthie became aware of health inequities that exist because of factors beyond our control. When she began to study public health at the University of Arizona, where she studied community health education, she analyzed how immigration policies affected the health of migrant farm workers. Ruthie then came to the Bloomberg School in order to focus more on the social determinants of health and health disparities. She earned her PhD in our Department of Health Policy and Management in 2012. After graduation, Ruthie began working for the Baltimore City Health Department as a Health Policies and Programs Administrator, where she helped city agencies implement health policies and initiatives throughout the city. Currently, Ruthie is working as a program consultant at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield's patient-centered medical home, where her job is to work with primary care practices across the state of Maryland to achieve quality improvement and cost savings for their patients. Ruthie's dedication and passion for the field of public health are truly inspired, inspiring, and we are thrilled to have her here to speak with you all today. So join me in welcoming Ruthie to the podium. Good morning. 
morning, everybody. Um, so like Tom said, I get really nervous when I speak in public, especially when I'm talking about myself. But the big difference here is when he's nervous, he comes up here and tells lots of jokes. Um, but for me, when I get nervous, I tend to say really silly things. Um, so I had to make sure the last time I was here, I had to ask that in case I do say something silly, first, will you forgive me? And second, I made them promise that they won't take my degree back. So um, I think we're OK. So I'm just I'm really excited to just have a chance to talk to, with, all, with all of you today um, and tell you just a little bit about my story, how I ended up here, what I kind of did here, and then kind of what I'm doing now. And so it was actually a really helpful exercise to you know go back and reflect, because things happen really quickly that sometimes you don't think about it. And I think when I was here, I really thought a lot of things happened pretty randomly. Um, like there was just no rhyme or reason. I just thought it was the cool thing to do next with my life. Um, but when I started to really think about why I ended up here, the kind of work that I'm doing now, it actually turns out to be a pretty logical and not so random um, chain of events. And so just. I guess to start off, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Anybody out there from Arizona? Really? Two, two people? Are you, oh wait, if you're Sun Devil fans, we're going to be friends. If you're Wildcat fans, we're best friends, OK? Wildcat? No. Oh. That's awesome. I love it. And you? That's OK. We're still friends. I appreciate it. I never meet people from Arizona. I'm not less nervous now. OK. <laughs> So I did go to the University of Arizona. I studied community health education out there. Um, I was all about grassroots efforts. I was all about the community, doing the empowerment there. Um, like you couldn't get me to not think about bottom up approaches to public health. And so uh, as Leslie said, I used to do research with um, migrant farm workers down by the US-Mexico border, trying to understand their health status because they're typically, un a lot of them are undocumented. So we just don't know what's going on with them. And so we went down there one uh, day to go visit our community partner. And he actually took us to the wall, like literally the big wall that divides the United States and Mexico. And uh, he was telling us some story. And all of a sudden, I'm just looking at this wall. And all of a sudden, I see a little head like pop over the wall. And I was like, oh, that's weird. And then little, like, literally like two seconds later, the man like jumps over the wall and just runs into the United States. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And of course, two seconds later, you know, the Border Patrol truck comes and pulls him over and like arrest him and takes him in the truck and takes him away. And so I asked our community partner, I was like, what's going to happen to this guy? Like, this is crazy. And he was saying, well, you know, he'll probably spend a couple days in jail, he'll be fined, and then eventually just taken back over the border. And I was like, this just doesn't make sense. And then I started to like question a lot of things. I was like, why am I sitting here focusing on, you know, all these downstream impacts of all these big upstream problems? And I was just like, I need to do a PhD in health policy. Like, that was my logical conclusion. And, um, <laughs> And I think like my love for health policy was really born out of uh, looking at border issues in Arizona. But I knew I was going to do a PhD in health policy. Like There was no changing my mind. Um, uh, one little problem, though, I was just a junior in college. You know, I uh, didn't have much, I didn't have any work experience. And I had a little, uh, little bit of research experience. But I was convinced. I was like, I'm just going to apply for PhD programs. And that's what I did. And I I didn't think I was going to get it anywhere, but um, one day I got a call from actually Tom Burke, you know, the fancy person who was just making you laugh and say all kinds of fun things. Uh, he gave me a call one day and he asked me, or he was telling me, you know, the admissions committee thought I had a lot of promise, um, but maybe wasn't ready for the PhD and asked me if I was willing to do the master's program. Remember what I said, like when I'm nervous, I say really silly things. Okay, so when he asked me, would I be willing to do the master's program? My answer was no. I wouldn't have applied if I didn't think I was ready. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah, now you understand. <laughs> um, and of course, he went on to say some other things that I don't remember because I'm literally, see, he can confirm that's what I said. And I'm sure he said really nice things to like make me feel better after that, but I was hitting my head against the wall. Like I was like, I just screwed up my chance to get into Hopkins. What am I doing with my life? Like, <laughs> It was bad. But you know, um, thankfully, a week later, I got a call from um, the person who ended up being my academic advisor and my mentor, Dr. Leviste. And he said, congratulations, you got into the PhD program. And I was like, happy to answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> For like a month, it was amazing. Um, and so then I came here. I came to Student Visitor Day. And I got to you know, ask as many questions as I possibly could. Um, and I think I ended up coming to Hopkins for, I think it was three things that really drove my decision. First was, um, first of all, they admitted me into the program that I wanted to be in. And 
there were people here studying and doing exactly what I wanted to study. And so I think that was really important because if there's not people here who are doing what it is you want to be doing, I mean, that's going to be kind of hard, right? And so not only was the one person who, you know, is the expert in the field who was willing to mentor me was going to be my advisor, um, but there was like a whole team of people who studied health disparities, who studied solutions and um, understanding how do you address the social determinants of health that's best for the community. I mean, there was tons of people doing that. And so, it, of course, it was just a match of interest and um, the program there. So I think the second reason was that they actually really believed in me. I mean, when somebody, regardless if you're trying to get a job or get into school or do something, if somebody takes a risk on you, like, um, I mean, Tom barely even knew me. We had one phone conversation, and then he went back and advocated for me. I mean, that just speaks so loudly to me, that that's how they value their students, that they believe in people. And I think that just made me feel like this could be a really cool place to be. And then, of course, I think the third reason was that uh, nobody told me no. Um, throughout my time, I asked a lot of questions, and nobody ever said, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. Um, I was like 22. I had big ideas and no idea how the real world worked. And here is literally the leading expert in health disparities in the country just sitting here telling me, we can figure out a way for you to do that. I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. So I said, sign me up. And I ended up coming here. And I spent four years here at Hopkins, um, did lots of cool things. But uh, it was definitely a challenge. I mean, being from Tucson, so I know Tom was joking around that we get uh, daylight in Baltimore. Tucson, we have 350 days of guaranteed sunshine. I mean, it's pretty great. Um, I've definitely gotten a lot paler since being out here. <laughs> uh, so. Life and, and I think it was a big adjustment for me. I was used to a slower pace of life. I was used to just a little bit more consistency. And then you come here, and things are super fast. I mean, we're on the quarter system, so that alone just makes you like run a little bit faster. And then uh, just like I think other people were saying, that you walk any floor in this building and in Hampton House, and then the new building that they're building across the street. I mean, there's tons of buildings. Uh, there's an expert somewhere doing something really cool, something really innovative, and you just have to sit and figure out, you know, whoa, like, how am I going to manage all of this? And so I think it actually took me a while to kind of find my footing. But the really great thing is that there's a fantastic student affairs support staff here who really actually um, helped me find my footing. And even, like, I'm going to be sticking around for, like, two hours today just so I can have lunch with one of the student affairs people because I just miss her so much. So that that shows you that there's a lot of support here. And I think um, when I was here during my time, so of course I did lots of cool things. Um, the first thing, of course, is you take lots and lots of classes. I mean, that's your first job as a student. Um, the four presenters you have today are all fantastic. Actually, Dr. Galen, who walked in, um, actually, when I was an admitted student, I came to your presentation. It was pretty cool. And I like I remember you asked a question. I knew the answer to it. I felt really smart. <laughs> Um, but also Dr. Bleich, Dr. Becker, and Dr. Sherman. I took classes with all of them. Um, and that also shows you I did take advantage of you know, taking classes in, in multiple departments, which is definitely doable. Um, then again, I was here for a PhD and took four years, so I took lots of classes. <laughs> Uh, and so the second thing that I did is I made lots of great friends, lots of great colleagues. Um, so there is the cohort system. I mean, if you're probably in a PhD program, you're going to have a cohort of 10 to 15. If you're in the master's program, maybe uh, about 20. If you're the MPH student, you have a cohort of 200 people, which is actually really important to have people who are going through the same thing that you're going through. But in case you don't like any of them, um, there are like 40 student groups. <laughs> and so you can find people who have a common interest as you, which um, I ended up doing both. I loved my cohort, and I also did lots of student groups. So uh, definitely, there's your, your pick of the litter there. And uh, I think. Of course, when you're here, you take advantage of lots of cool projects, whether it's in the practice world or whether it's in the research world. And so um, I think Leslie said, I did lots of social determinants of health research while I was here. Um, and I think those types of projects, it led me to actually have a conversation with Tom. Again, Tom is a very important person in my life. <laughs> Just say that in general. Um, we were having a conversation you know, about what I want to do when I finally finish my PhD. And uh, he was like, you know, the health department is starting to do stuff around the social determinants of health. You should talk to them. And I said, OK. So I talked to them, which ended up leading to an internship, which actually ended up leading to a job, which is great, because you know, that's an important statistic that they show is you know, we do get jobs. And uh, I worked for the health department for about two years. 
I had a really interesting role where I had to convince city agencies that they had a really important role in health and then help them come up with policies and initiatives to actually do something about it in their own unique ways. And so you can imagine taking classes and all these different departments and meeting people from all over. It was actually really helpful to be able to speak uh, speak to people from all walks of life and actually convince these people that, you know, on top of everything else they're doing, that they should be doing health also. So it was a lot of fun there. Um, and then I'm trying to think, what else did I do when I was at Hopkins? Um, oh, oh, of course, the, the most important thing, right, is that I wrote a brilliant dissertation. You should all read it. Um, <laughs> it was about the effects of the economic recession on health and health disparities. And so I think that's important because you see me smiling when I talk about my dissertation. So all those potential PhD students in the, in the audience, I still like my dissertation. I still like my mentors and my dissertation committee. So I think that's important that the dissertation is not as miserable as make people make it sound. And so I think uh, when I look back at all my experiences, I, I really love policy. Um, I love the implementation of policy. I love figuring out um, what kind of decisions need to be made. And you know, I told you I worked at the health department, but right now I'm actually working at Care First, which is our regional Blue Cross Blue Cross Blue Shield um, health insurance plan. And I'll definitely need more time to explain how I ended up working at a health insurance company, considering the only class I've ever taken related to healthcare was US to the healthcare system, and I actually audited it. I didn't even take it. So um, I will tell you this, though. It was one of my Hopkins colleagues that got me this job. And um, now I get to kind of go around the state and promote population health improvement um, to physicians. So it's still very public health, lots of public health management. Um, I love the Affordable Care Act because I'm pretty much guaranteed a job for like the next 10 years. So I really have no complaints. Um, and so I think I, I look back at my time at Hopkins and uh, you know, I think I told you in the beginning, I thought a lot of things were pretty random, but I feel like the story I just told you is somewhat logical. It's not completely random. Things kind of fell together really nicely. And I think that's really the key, um, is that on my worst days where I can't think straight, or even on my best days where I, I know exactly what I'm doing, I always come up with the same conclusion about my time at Hopkins. And that was that I got exactly what I needed from my time here without even realizing it. I um, was trained in the methods that I need to be trained in. I was able to do the work that I, I wanted to do. And I was able to become the kind of public health professional that I, I wanted to be. And if that happened to me without even kind of realizing it, I think um, the message there is that, you know, what happens if I actually was a little bit more intentional about it? I mean, what else could I gotten out of this? Um, which I shouldn't say that, but you know, uh, I think when you're sitting down and making this decision, I know you're, you're going around and visiting lots of schools and on planes and trains and on cars or and, and visiting everybody. Um, we do have really good hoodies. They're really soft. I sleep in mine all the time. Uh, but when you're, when you're making this decision, it shouldn't be a random decision. Um, let it be really logical. I sat down and I looked at what exactly did I want? Um, was Hopkins actually offering what I wanted? And it turned out they were. And it turned out to be a really great fit for me. So I encourage you to do the same. Hopkins offers so much to their students, whether it's in the academic world, practice world, you know, even the social world. I, a lot of my closest friends now are Hopkins graduates. And so um, I encourage you that Whatever decision you make, um, just make sure you're going to get whatever you, you want to get out of it. And if that turns out to be Hopkins, then we could be best friends. All right? <laughs> so uh, thank you for letting me have a chance to talk with you today. Thank you, Ruthie. All right, we're getting ready to break out into our seminar series. Hold up, hold up. <laughs> i got to go through the logistics first. Um, <laughs> So we are, the seminar series are broken up into four different locations, um, and you have the option to choose which one. We know a lot of you would like the opportunity to sit in on classes, so we have too many of you to do that and try to figure out which one makes sense. So we're going to give you the option and bringing the faculty to you to do a, a presentation. So Dr. Andrea Galen will be in here in Sheldon Hall. Um, Professor Stan Becker is going to be in Becton Dickinson room, which is right across the hall. We have signs and people that will direct you. Um, Dr. Sarah Bleich is going to be in the Anna Bacher room. Make a right out of here, and then when you hit a T, make a left. Um, again, there's signs and stuff that will help you get to where you need to be. And then W2030, that's actually up on the next floor. Um, make a right out of here until you hit a T. Take the stairway up one floor, and there's signs that'll get you to W2030. Um, so again, you have the option to pick which, um, which presentation you'd like to attend. And before we go, okay. I'm ready now. <laughs> I got something else to do. <laughs>
So Tom really thinks he looks awesome in his hoodie, as we all do. This, this is my natural state. <laughs> it's all of our natural state. Yeah. I have to be careful of the sun. So. <laughs> so we do have a few to give out. If you lift up the desk that you're sitting at um, and check the desk maybe next to you as well, if there's a Hopkins sticky, you win a hoodie. <laughs> So those of you who win, you have to. So bring me your sticky and you can get a hoodie. Otherwise, have a great time at your seminar, seminar series. We'll be back here at 11 o'clock. Too much stuff. I'm holding too much stuff. <laughs> yeah, he'll put it back on. Yeah. Here's Dr. Andrea Galen, who will be presenting this morning's seminar. Dr. Galen is the Professor on Health Behavior and Society Department and the Director of the Center for Injury Research and Policy. Dr. Galen's research interests are in the development and evaluation of community and clinic-based programs that address health behavior problems affecting women and children, primarily among low-income families in urban areas. And here's Andrew. Thank you. Oh. Thanks. You don't have to do that. <laughs> wait. Just wait till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you still feel that way. I'm glad to see you all here. I um, assume that means you have an interest in health behavior, which is great. We do a lot of work in health behavior here at the school. Um, can I just get a sense of, um, so how many are for the master's programs? Okay, great. And doctoral? Couple? Okay, good. And um, so you've all been admitted. Congratulations. Um, anybody already decided they're coming? Yay, all right, very good. Um, good, so my job is easier. I think my job is supposed to be uh, to try to talk you into how, why it's so great to be here. Um, and I thought about what I could do, and I was gonna do a song and a dance following Tom, trying to follow Tom Burke as, uh, with his, his uh, uh, good approaches, but um, I realized that I can't carry a tune and my dancing days are kind of over. So <laughs> I think I'm going to just give you a, a, a little mini lecture of um, to give you a flavor and an example of how we approach the topic of health behavior and health behavior change. Um, it's something that um, is near and dear to our hearts, that all the master's students have some competencies in behavioral sciences before they graduate, and of course for the doctoral students that they have an opportunity to get um, depth in, in the field. So. Um, I start with, you heard my introduction, but this is really my introduction, and if you feel this way, you're in the right place. So when I grow up, I'd like to study about people. People interest me. I'd like to go to some big university to study all about people. I see you want to learn about people so that with your knowledge, you'll be equipped to help them. No, I'm just nosy. <laughs> so... So if this is of interest to you to try to understand and figure out why people behave the way they do, um, hopefully um, studying here will help give you some answers. Um, so I want to cover three areas and hopefully have plenty of time for um, conversation. Um, I want to talk about why, why do we in public health care about behavior? Are there, in fact, examples of successfully changing behaviors? Because you may often hear, it's just too hard to change behavior. Don't even try. Well, I'm hoping that um, you don't share that view, and I can give you a couple of examples that will persuade you otherwise. And um, then how can we help ourselves and help others adopt and maintain healthy behaviors? So that's what I'm going to um, start with. Hi. Um, um, why do we care about behaviors? Well, let's start with an understanding of what are the leading causes of death in the United States. Um, and what you see here are the rank order from 1 to 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States in 2010. And across the top, you see the age groups. So if you look at just the total, we see that there are um, 597,000 deaths due to heart disease is number one. Malignant neoplasms is number two, then chronic lower respiratory disease, cerebrovascular disease, and unintentional injury. Um, 
I always use this slide because, as you heard, I'm from the uh, Center for Injury Research and Policy. And why we like to use it is because I hope um, you can tell that uh, the blue boxes are unintentional injury, the red boxes are homicide, and the green boxes are suicide. So we're never allowed from the center to go and give a talk without showing this slide because most people don't realize that injuries are, in fact, the leading cause of death from ages 1 to 44, um, and overall fifth. But in any case, so this approach gives you an idea about what the big health problems are in this country. Um, but really, what when we think about these particular health problems, we should be thinking about what are the risk factors for each of those. And it's no surprise, I'm sure, to you all that behavioral risk factors are play a big role in all of these leading causes of death. So for cardiovascular disease, smoking, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, Cancer, similarly, stroke, unintentional injuries. We have alcohol use, non-use of seatbelts, um, suicide, homicide. We have alcohol use and handgun use. So it's not just that we can rattle off what the behavioral risk factors are, which I suspect you all knew before you walked in the room that smoking is bad for us, right? Um, but when you look at what proportion of the deaths can be attributed to these behavioral risk factors, it's really quite staggering. Um, this was done, the first column is from 1990, and the second column is in the year 2000, um, where um, these uh, investigators looked at what proportion of the deaths can be attributed to different fact factors, and they called this the actual causes of death. And what you see is tobacco leads the list, poor diet and physical activity is second, and so tobacco accounts for 18 to 19 percent of all deaths. Poor diet and lack of physical activity accounts for um, 16, it's, it's actually gone up since 1990, almost 17 percent of the deaths. Alcohol consumption and on down. Um, so this is really, um, it's really staggering to say that at the bottom, the total 50%, roughly 50% of all the deaths in the US um, are attributed to health behaviors. So we think that it, they're very important and that in order to do public health programs and implement public health policies, you really need to understand um, how do, how do these behaviors come to be? What do we need to know to change these behaviors? And, and how can public health contribute to that? So I'm going to start with giving you a couple of examples of, um, of successful attempts to change behavior. And this is the first part of our audience participation of the morning <laughs> for this lecture. But I'm not going to ask you any embarrassing questions like, what behavior have you changed? But you're welcome to share that later if you like. But <clears throat> so here is a picture of a public health achievement that is from 1925 to 1995. You can see that something was really increasing in the green line, and something else was really decreasing in the blue line over time. And this is one of the 10 greatest public health achievements, according to the Centers for Disease Control, of the last century. So anybody have a guess? Uh-huh. Nope. Good guess. Uh-huh. Nope. Another good guess. You guys are right on it. Uh-huh. No, really good guess, though. All of these are really good guesses. You know something about public health and, it, and what it's been about over the last century. Mm-hmm. Okay, another good guess, and um, I'll, let me give you all a hint. I'm from the Injury Center. Close, 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 close. <laughs> I wish I had a, um, I don't have any more giveaways for you. Um, so what it is is actually uh, motor vehicle deaths. So what you see in the green line is the vehicle miles traveled has increased dramatically over this period, while the deaths from motor vehicle crashes um, have decreased dramatically. This, you can't get a better graph than this to look at something that's a, a public health achievement. We've got increasing exposure to a hazard and decreasing deaths from that hazard. So what do you think is behind that? What do you, th what, what do you think accounts for that? You mentioned the first seatbelt use. Cars are safer. Good. 
airbags, <laughs> traffic lights, yes, that's true, they are very important, <laughs> as we see in developing countries that are getting more and more motorized that don't have those things. Laws that regulate the behavior and speed limits. Great, great. Any, any particular kinds of laws that you're thinking about? Like what behaviors are regulated? Ticket or click it. <laughs> Ticket or click it, good. Yeah. DUI, yep. Good, okay, great. So I think we hit everything. Um, people who have actually studied this carefully um, have sort of summarized the reasons behind these achievements in terms of changing environments and changing individuals. So we have interstate highways, better roadway designs, better cars, the motor vehicle safety standards are stronger, and law enforcement. And the behaviors that have changed, in part as a result of those environmental changes, but also because we became better educated about what the hazards were and what, how to pr protect ourselves from them. Um, so increases in seatbelt use, car seat use, and then drinking and driving has really gone down as well. Um, very good. Any, any questions on that? Because I have another one. Okay. So here's another great public health achievement of the 20th century. Now this one has been mentioned in the last slides. So here we have something that was increasing and then it took a turn for the better. It's a bad thing we don't want people to do. Yes. Thank you, excellent. Okay, so this is actually the one um, that talks about the public health achievement of the 20th century because that also made the CDC list of the top 20, uh, top 10 in the last century. So um, what kinds of things might account for this uh, decreasing uh, consumption of cigarettes? Uh-huh. Say a little bit more. Yeah, better awareness of the problem. Mm -hmm. Regulation of advertising, especially children. At regulation of advertising, that's good. Uh huh. Indoor smoking bans. Indoor smoking bans, excellent. Uh huh. Taxes on cigarettes. Taxes on cigarettes. We have another one. Yeah, oh, you got the same one. Okay, great. Oh, go ahead. Changing of the packaging on cigarettes. I mean, it's the Mm hmm. Increasing awareness of the hazards and, and better messaging. Good. Okay, well, if you actually, um, you can, well, people at CDC have done this, um, have actually plotted some of the um, societal events that were happening at the time when against the adult per capita cigarette consumption from 1900 to 2000. And I think you mentioned a lot of the important ones. Um, in terms of awareness, uh, you can see... Um, the first smoking cancer, con oh, sorry, we're recording, I have to stay here. Um, the first smoking cancer concern coming out, um, where that's that little peak there um, around the 1950s, and then a little bit of a drop, but the first Surgeon General's report came out, and you can see it later um, in the middle there, where there started to be a decline. Um, things really started taking a downward trend. And other things that were happening at the same time were in addition to awareness raising and making people understand what the problems were, there were also these uh, external things that you mentioned, um, like on TV and radio, if you had if you advertised cigarettes, you had to have a comparable amount of time um, that was public service and then was the broadcast at the broadcast ad ban came later um, and then the federal cigarette taxes doubles you can see that over here on the right hand side you mentioned that as well um, I don't know if anybody mentioned the idea of um, it's not just my smoking it's your smoking that's affecting my health um, that was a very important um, event as well when the Surgeon General put out a report on environmental tobacco smoke. Um, and then finally, the Master, Settle Agreement, Master Settlement Agreement. Um, so uh, this, I think, I hope, um, gives you an example. So you all knew, you knew a lot about both of these things. Um, if you were going to sort of categorize the kinds of interventions that we're talking about that contributed to these changes, do you have an idea about how you might categorize them? Sorry. 
Just two categories. <laughs> Policy and education would be a good one. I was thinking about what we said about seatbelts, that we have categories of influencing factors that help us change individuals, but also help us change environments. And the same thing is true with the tobacco example as it was with the seatbelt example, because a lot of these things out here you see are things in the external environment that shape the world we live in, the world we're exposed to, and influence our behavior in that way. I mean, when I first started here, to tell you how old I am, we could smoke in our offices. People did. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine that now, isn't it? So changing that environmental factor really helped people quit and also helped clear the air for everybody else. Um, so in, in tobacco, they talk about the same thing of changing individuals and changing environments. And one important thing um, that, that it, to think about is did we, we changed how we talked about it and how we thought about it. So yes, um, smoking cessation is import, was important. Um, smoking prevention was important. But really, we had to also focus more upstream, and we started talking about tobacco control and thinking about where is the tobacco coming from, who's making the money on it, and really thinking about um, how those really externalities affect us. Um, and certainly, the Master Settlement Agreement was um, an example of successes in control controlling tobacco, controlling the product. Um, so that's a big theme in the work that we do. Um, and I hope it's illustrated in this slide. <laughs> when I asked the class what this was the first time, we got it was like a Rorschach test. It was really interesting to see how people interpreted this. But the point of it is that context matters, right? This would not surprise you if you were in a zoo, but the fact that you have these animals walking down the street of Manhattan is a little bit surprising. So this notion that our context really matters is really critical to all the work that we do. Um, and we call that an ecological approach to health promotion. Have people heard of ecological approaches in any of your courses before? Some, yes, yes, yes. Okay, pardon? I'm a social worker. Oh, okay. Oh, good. OK, so you know that we have to focus on this individual in the middle. Um, but really, to influence individuals, we have to think about all of these external factors that shape both our environment and our thinking um, about issues. So that's really a conceptual framework um, that helps us think about both the individual and the environment. Um, and I won't read these to you, but just to um, summarize, you know, it's not enough to just think about that individual um, and his or her own behavior. It's important to understand what people know and believe, but we have to think beyond them in terms of how do the groups that we associate with, um, our family, our friends and peers, how do they um, shape what we do and what we believe? And then even further out, we have our institutional factors, um, our community factors, and public policy. Um, and all of these things um, shape what we're able to do, what we want to do, and what we actually do. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So it's not just that we say this, but um, the Institute of Medicine, which um, is an important um, uh, organization that does a lot in terms of um, covering public health issues and trying to bring the science together and make recommendations about how different aspects of health and, and society um, can be improved. And when they looked at health promotion, they found an emerging consensus that research and interventions should be based on an ecological model. Now, there are a lot of issues related to that. So if you come here, you'll get well, <laughs> well versed in sort of how do you work at all these different levels? How do these these different levels interact with each other to really produce change. And there's a lot of very exciting work going on to really understand that process. Um, looking at physical environment, the built environment, as well as the social environment. And both of those things require new research tools that we hadn't had before, um, that we have experts in here, um, whether it's you know, ge geographic mapping or doing multi-level modeling, all of 
the kinds of tools that um, will help you both understand how context matters and then help you figure out what to do about that. Um, in your in your own work, whether it's in practice or um, in research. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I want to turn to the last part of our um, the last question that I want to address, which is, if we buy that, does anybody have a problem with that? You're all okay on board with individuals and environments? Good. Okay. Um, so if we believe all that, how can we help ourselves and help others to really adopt and maintain healthy behaviors? Um, and it's challenging, um, for sure. Um, we do know one of the fundamental things that we've learned um, over the past few decades is that if you're going to do behavior change interventions, you really need to look at the environmental components that will make the desired behavior the easier choice or the default choice. So you have to go out of your way to find a high sugar drink um, in schools. The default is low sugar drinks. Um, and you see some examples here, no smoking signs, stairs that look appealing and that are accessible. Um, you know, often, it, nine times out of 10, the elevator is right there. You know where it is and it's easy, but the stairs are behind some dark, dark door in some corner, um, wh whereas if you make them more available and accessible and attractive, more people are going to use them. And the same thing with good nutrition. I mean, there's lots of work being done on food deserts and how um, certain communities don't have access to the healthy foods. So all of these things um, are, consi are considerations that when you're trying to do health promotion programs, um, you need to take into account. But having said that, um, we don't do that at the risk of ignoring the individual. So clearly, the individual is at the center of that ecological model, and we still have to focus on what do individuals um, need to know and, and do, and how do we communicate that. I'm trying to fit 30 minutes of daily exercise into my busy schedule. Today, I took 120 15-second walks. So clearly, we have to think about what is our message, how, is it res how does it resonate with our audience, do they understand what we want them to do? Um, and I want to give you some, I'm not going to talk a lot about theory, because it's, uh, it's Maybe not for a morning conversation. We'll do that another time when you come. But um, there are a lot of theoretical um, concepts that help you figure out what you're going to do with an audience that you want to serve. So to introduce that idea, us, this is our next part of audience participation. Um, if you'll indulge me, if everybody would stand up for a second. Uh, you can stretch, too, if you want. We're not going to do exercise, but go ahead while you're up. <laughs> okay. All right. So now you can stay standing if you wear your seatbelt on every ride. Good, 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 good. <laughs> um, if you always eat food you think is healthy. <laughs> oh, I got to put that one at the bottom of the list. Good job, good job. Exercise regularly. <laughs> okay, excellent. You can't get back up, by the way. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> one and done, one and done. <laughs> <laughs> um, drink alcohol only in moderation and floss your teeth every day. So we have a few, we have a few. Good job, good job. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I would have sat down too, but I don't have a chair, so I don't want you to know which one, but <laughs> um, you might guess it's not, it's not the exercise. Uh, but anyway, so what's the point of that? The point of that is not to make you feel guilty because you sat down early. <laughs> um, what do you think, that, what does that illustrate if you're thinking about behavior change and behavior change theory? Yes, please. Excellent. That's exactly right. Um, so what we say, what we say in health promotion is information is necessary but insufficient for behavior change. And that's sort of a truism that everybody goes, ah, oh, yes, of course that's true. But how many times have you picked up an educational brochure or watched an educational video and it's like your brain is going to explode because they have given you so much information that is irrelevant to your question that you don't really need to know. Um, 
So if we don't appreciate the fact that information is necessary and how do we communicate it effectively, um, or that we just simply rely on information to change behavior, we're not going to be as effective. And one important point, um, and I'm trying to touch on lots of different issues here, because, and each of these things are topic areas that um, we have courses in where you can go in much more depth. And related to this point um, is the notion of literacy. So if we want to have effective information sharing, we have to appreciate um, that people have literacy issues, which is obviously the ability to read, write, and understand written material. But what may surprise you is that 21% of adults, which is more than 40 million people in the US, read at or below the fifth grade reading level. And an additional 25% read at or below the eighth grade level. Now, there, was a, there were a couple studies in my particular field of interest which, which had to do with child safety, and we looked at the average um, grade level of car seat instructions, and it was 10th grade. Um, if you look at other educational print materials for uh, parents, 80% were written at 10th grade reading level. So it's an issue of um, both knowing the proper place for information in a comprehensive strategy for health promotion, as well as doing it as effectively as possible, which means recognizing literacy as well as cultural values and lots of other things. Um, so what else besides information do people need to change behavior? Well, there are probably as many behavior change theories as there are people in the room. And they all have things in them that have these funny sounding terms and concepts, but when you break them all down and compile what really seems to show up in the evidence about changing individual behavior, um, you can see that um, there are really eight key issues um, that the major theorists in health behavior have identified. Um, and that is that people have to have a strong positive intention, again, this isn't rocket science, but it's science, and we know that people have to want to do something before you're going to get them to do it. Um, environmental barriers, you have to address how to, how to um, prevent environmental barriers. Um, and people have to have the necessary skills. Um, car seats are such a great example because they're life-saving, um, they're widely available, um, but now we see that even though 80% or 90% of parents are using car seats, about that many of the car seats are being used incorrectly. So necessary skills is something that you can't overlook. And then those, those are considered to be the three primary issues. And the rest that are listed here will determine how quickly or slowly um, your, pop, your group will change their behavior. You want people to believe that the pros outweigh the cons of doing what you want them to do. You want them to know that other people want them to do the, these behaviors, normative pressure. Whatever the behavior is, it's consistent with the kind of person I am. I'm not the kind of person who would drink and drive. Um, my emotional reaction to the behavior is more positive than negative. Um, this was an issue, I, I keep going back to car seats, but this was an issue with early on in car seats because parents and grandparents saw, had a negative emotional reaction to them because they couldn't hold their baby. Um, and it was, it, you know, that was something that was overcome, obviously. And then they have to believe that they're capable, which is a concept that's in major health behavior change theories, almost all of them, um, known as self-efficacy. So that's it for the sort of overview of the kinds of things that we discuss when we teach people how to do these programs or how to build a research program that helps us improve how we um, change behavior. And what I thought I would do in the last um, portion of the time we have together is to walk through an example of what we've um, done here at um, Hopkins over the past um, little while. Um, but before I turn to the example, does anybody have any comments or questions? Reactions? <laughs> no? Good to go? All right. All right. So the example that I'm going to share is called the Safe Home Project. No surprise, it has to do with injury. Um, but hopefully you can generalize from this to other topics if injury isn't your passion yet. But come here, we'll work on you. 
Um, um, so the Safe Home Project is a collaboration with uh, Hopkins Department of Pediatrics and our center that had federal funding and, and private funding. And it was really set up to address um, Baltimore City families um, who um, in, in the East Baltimore community are typically characterized as um, low income. And what we found in um, here, this was our commissioner of health. He is now the commissioner for the state health department, but he was the Baltimore City Commissioner of Health, and he acknowledged the importance of injuries as a public health problem. And what we found from the data were that unintentional injuries were the leading cause of death um, for children and young teens. And in Baltimore, 38% were due to house fires, and 37% were uh, due to motor vehicles. And Baltimore children were actually four times as likely to die from a residential fire as children nationwide. And then in the poor, in poor children who were on Medicaid, we found that they were having injury rates that were twice the national average. So I should have prefaced all of my um, talk about how do we do health behavior change programs, emphasizing the need for good data. So this is just a quick example of the kinds of data that are used to shape um, our interventions and what we do. So we were working in the um, Well Child Clinic at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and specifically focused on kids from zero to two years old. Um, and what we wanted to do is to improve the safety behaviors that were related to some of the important injury um, problems that we identified. Um, in particular, smoke alarms, the lack of working smoke alarms was underlying a lot of the uh, residential fire problems in Baltimore City. And then there are other sort of child-proofing things that parents are encouraged to do that our parents in the clinic didn't report doing very often. And those were things like locking up their um, dangerous products and um, medicines, uh, cleaning products, and so forth, using proper cabinet locks. And just as a sidebar, um, this is actually um, becoming even more important from some, I think, interesting ways that you might not think about. Um, if you've been reading anything about the prescription pain med medicine issues in the United States, poisoning is almost um, causing as many deaths as motor vehicle crashes now. In some places, it's the number one cause of death um, from pain medication overdoses. So we know that they're much more widely prescribed now and that adults have them in their house. So it's becoming, we can see increasing trends in kids being exposed as we see increasing trends in just ha adults having those prescriptions. So cabinet locks, again, are very important. Another product, that is um, increasing poisoning exposures in kids is the, the stuff you put in the e-cigarettes. Yeah, I know. I was really surprised. It's just starting to come out um, that that stuff is incredibly toxic, and people are just having it around, I guess, to fill their e-cigarettes. I don't know much about e-cigarettes. But when kids get a hold of it, it can actually kill them. So cabinet locks are something that still very highly recommended. And you know, with these changing, changing characteristics of what people have in their homes, they become even more important. Syrup of Ipecac, does anybody know what that is? Yeah, OK. It used to be recommended for parents to have in their household. It no longer is, which is why I have it in parentheses. When we did the study, it was. And then, of course, safety gates so kids don't fall downstairs, and safe hot water temperatures. Because um, a lot of, I don't know, how many of you know what the temperature is of your hot water out of the tap? Yeah, that's usually about right. <laughs> no. um, so it really. Um, how, scalding, scalding occurs all too frequently, um, particularly for young children and older adults, because the water coming out of our tap is uh, often um, over 140 degrees. It really should be around 120 um, to reduce the, uh, the likelihood of a scald burn, and especially with little kids. So it's a real problem in older ho housing stock, which we have a lot of um, in this environment. So I hope you're noticing that I started all the way over here on the right, which, are, which is our outcome. That's what we want to do. And most of the time, um, we find that people start all the way over on the left. They, oh, here's the problem. Well, here's the solution. Um, 
And what we try to teach when we teach building health promotion programs is that you really need to start with an understanding of the safety behaviors, which is what we did in our clinic setting to identify the fact that caregivers had inadequate knowledge about child injury prevention. They believed that their child wouldn't really get seriously hurt if they got injured. Um, and they didn't really have the skills to know where to get a smoke alarm, how to install a safety gate. They also felt like there wasn't any encouragement encouragement for it. Their doctors hadn't talked about it. We listened to audio tapes of pediatricians and parents during the medical visit, almost no discussion of these topics. Um, and then they also didn't have any access to the resources. So families said things like, well, I'd love to go get a stair gate, but first of all, I don't have the money. And second of all, I'd have to take two buses with my three kids to go get it. So there were some real world barriers, remember environmental barriers that we needed to think about. So with an understanding of those um, determinants, um, we built a comprehensive program that changed um, how wanted to change how individuals thought and behaved, as well as reducing the environmental barriers to doing the behaviors that are recommended. So our, the first thing we tackled was pediatric counseling. And we did a, a training program for pediatricians to teach them a counseling framework that is associated with improved behavioral outcomes. So a lot of times, like we said at the beginning about just information dumping um, is not effective. And pediatric doctors have lots of demands on their time and have a lot of information to communicate, especially pediatricians who have a huge um, amount of anticipatory guidance that they do. So we tried to teach them a way to do that counseling that was more focused, where you find out what the person already knows through soliciting information from them, providing tailored advice, focusing on the risks and barriers so that you could try to reduce barriers, and then encourage compliance. Uh, as your doctor, I really care about this, and I'm going to I'm going to see how much you know progress you were able to make next time I see you. Um, that kind of encouraging closure. Um, so that's what we asked the pediatricians to do with their um, well child visits. Um, then to reduce the environmental barriers, we built the Children's Safety Center, which is, was adjacent to the clinic, and it was built out like a little home environment where families could get a prescription from their doctor, go to the safety store, um, they could figure out what products they needed, and they could get personalized education about how to use the product and why they needed to use the product. Um, and then the third intervention component, remember we, we always keep talking about having to be comprehensive and working at multiple levels. Um, so the third thing we wanted to do was sort of more in the community to have home visits so that moms could get what they needed, they would learn from their doctor, learn from the safety center, get what they needed, and have someone in their home who could help them um, both identify the hazards, personalize the education, coach them on how to install it, and remind them about the resources of the um, Children's Safety Center. So being, um, be, being researchers, um, it's one of the things that is great. And for master's students who want to go out into practice, this is still really relevant to you um, because these are the kinds of programs that you can do in the field. I feel like doubly blessed because I get to do these programs um, and I get to work with students here in an academic environment. But so both intervention research, like the work that we do here, and intervention in practice are the kinds of things that you'll learn how to do and be around people who you know get jazzed up about that in whatever their topic area of interest is. So we did an evaluation as part of as part of the intervention trial and I'll just tell you very quickly what we um, what we found and I can talk more about the methods if anybody's interested but um, Basically, the, what we found was that the training program for the physicians actually increased the amount and the quality of the physician counseling. So we, again, listened to audio tapes and, and coded what we were hearing. Um, 
So the counseling that was improved, so let me, let me just point out that we changed the behavior of doctors. That's a pretty good thing. Um, now, for parents, who was our primary audience, um, we found that the counseling led to more satisfied patients but had no effect on safety practices, which shouldn't surprise you given the territory we've just covered. Remember, environmental barriers. So just counseling alone, information necessary but not sufficient for behavior change. Um, Nevertheless, if you're in a clinical setting, having happy patients that are satisfied is a really good indicator. So that's a good thing. Um, but when the families um, received the counseling from the doctor and they visited the Children's Safety Center, we could, um, by observation in the homes, document that they had more safety behaviors. Um, and these were both in randomized designs. Um, so those two things together really um, did seem to improve the safety of the home environment for these high-risk kids. Um, and interestingly, the home visit had no added benefit, um, which, <clears throat> you know, home visiting, pro we could talk about home visiting programs more if you're interested. I mean, the reason they didn't in our case was because we had a very limited home visiting intervention. We only went one time. We couldn't do any installations of products, but um, so that's not to say that all home visiting is ineffective. In fact, some of it's incredibly effective, but it takes a lot of resources. Um, so the end of the story with this is um, we were in the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and the hospital administration was pleased with the results and the fact that we were offering this service to their patients. And so I think this was done, let's see, it opened in, I lose track of decades now, not just years. That's very embarrassing. So uh, I think this was back, um, way, way, way back in the 90s. But um, we've been in business ever since then. So this is a now, instead of a research program that we tested, it's now a service program that operates in the um, children's hospital here. And in fact, um, we were able to do a dissemination guide, and we work with the um, National Association of Children's Hospitals, and there are about, last count, I think there are about 25 or 26 um, safety stores like this in children's hospitals around the country. Um, and my colleague, who's the director of it, I Eileen McDonald is um, involved now in a national evaluation of um, how these programs work and what impact they have. And we're very excited about that. I, we feel like if injuries are the leading cause of death, um, we need a pharmacy for safety. You need to send your, your family someplace where they can get what it is they need to protect their kids. So um, it has, it's, a, I think, a nice story with a good ending. Um, but the problem might be, you might be thinking, well, not everybody wants to come to Hopkins, into the hospital. And we thought the same thing. So after this study, we took it on the road. We partnered with our Baltimore City Fire Department, and we took the model, so the model of education and access to safety products in an effectively communicated way, and built the Mobile Safety Center, um, which travels around Baltimore City to community events and um, basically has um, interactive educational exhibits on it and um, low-cost safety products and um, then teaches kids also uh, it's focused also a little bit on kids which we weren't in the safety center um, and teaches them what to do when the smoke alarm goes off and so the bedroom gets all full of smoke and fake smoke of course and they practice they practice what they learn so those were the um, that's really what I wanted to share with you I hope that the sort of more theoretical part at the beginning is illustrated more concretely in the example of the, of the work that um, we're doing in this particular um, issue area. And just to summarize, um, I think we've tried to demonstrate how behavior is an important contributor to public health, um, that behavior change theory and methods can really contribute to the solutions. There are many successful examples of behavior change at multiple levels of um, individuals in groups to society at large. Um, and then really comprehensive approaches are always needed when you're talking about changing behavior. 
And the very last thing I think that you need if you're going to get in the behavior change business is a lot of patience and wisdom, which are illustrated here. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and stay after to talk to anybody. If you're pondering whether to come or what your interest is, I can point you to some other faculty who might be working in your area. And um, we're certainly excited that you're all admitted, and hopefully all will be coming. So thanks very much, and hope to see you in the fall. Yeah, I think the other journals are great.
My name is Fumi Olalon. My name is Adam Hoffer. I didn't know much about the city, um, and it was really fun to move here and learn about the different neighborhoods and explore um, what it has to offer. I really do think that this is a great city where people are walking around, lots of people have their dogs, and it's really a comfortable, relaxed environment. I think that the um, media that Baltimore gets is quite unfair because it is a great place to be. So one of the great things about Baltimore is that they do make it bike accessible and there's lots of places downtown that you can bike through, major roads and everything to get where you need to go, and a lot of students do bike to class. The fact that there are many places that families can go and spend time together. I think it really is a city of neighborhoods and being able to like do different activities on the weekends and 
try out different restaurants and stuff like that has been fun. So one of the great things about Baltimore, it has a really thriving live music scene and there's lots of local venues you can go see. When I first started looking for apartments, it was all online and I thought they were surely a scam. For what I was paying for a tiny, tiny one bedroom in Boston, I could get a two bedroom apartment here in Baltimore and pay, pay less at that. It's quite affordable. Uh, my family living in New York, DC, and it's really significantly more expensive and that makes it uh, possible to use your money towards other activities that you might enjoy doing while you're in Baltimore. It's a comfortable feeling I have to be able to focus on my studies and not worry what's happening to my son because I know he's in good hands in school. I think everybody brings different things from their backgrounds and it's really very useful to be able to learn from other students because I think at Hopkins the students are as great a resource as the faculty themselves. Who can beat Hopkins? <laughs> you know, might as well go for number one, right? <laughs>tell we're shifting gears a little bit um, and we're going to be hearing from um, about what life is like here for our students in Baltimore um, and also what you can do as far as when you're here as a student and working with the community. Um, so we're getting ready to hear from our next presenter Elizabeth Dorr who's our Associate Director of SOURCE which stands for our Student Outreach Resource Center um, and then we'll be inviting our student panelists up to the front of the stage and it'll be your opportunity to ask some questions um, and they can be whatever you want. Um, so at this time I'd like to introduce Elizabeth. There you go. Hi everyone, um, as Leslie said, I'm the Associate Director of SOURCE um, and you're going to hear a lot about SOURCE um, when you come to Hopkins in the fall or in the, in the summer and so, um, um, but just to give you a little bit of background, I'm going to just talk very briefly about what we do and, and who we are um, and then I'm going to talk about Baltimore in general and living in Baltimore. So SOURCE stands for Student Outreach Resource Center, we're the Community Service and Service Learning Center for the schools of medicine, nursing, and public health. So we um, we are we have um, a place in all of the three schools on the medical campus. So it's a great opportunity to also get to know students um, from other uh, uh, from the other schools at the health professional schools. Um, so what we do is. Uh, we basically create partnerships for students from all the health professional schools to collaborate with public health organizations in Baltimore City. Um, we have about um, 100 different community-based organizations that are part of our network. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities to get involved with Baltimore through their practicum, through other programs and projects that we have. Um, I'm not going to go into specifically what all of those are um, quite yet, but you know you can talk to us at the at the student involvement fair later today. Um, so why why work with the community-based organizations as a part of your time in Hopkins? Um, first, it's it's a it's a very clear academic. Um, purpose of applying theory to practice. You're actually, you're learning all of this great stuff in the classroom, so now you're putting it into action in the real world. Um, you're also assisting understaffed nonprofits. So these, these nonprofits that you're working with actually need the work that you're going to be doing. And so we help to, to, um, to create those partnerships so you're actually fulfilling a community identified need. Um, it's a great way um, to develop your career and network with folks in Baltimore and within um, the public health community as a whole. Um, it also builds a sense of, a commu of community. It's one of the best ways to get to know the city that you're living and working and, and studying in. And so I really recommend um, doing this just to learn about Baltimore as well. And then you're actually truly making a difference. These organizations need these projects and, and they're understaffed and, and don't have enough time. And so it's a great way to, to get some academic credit while also making a difference. Um, Baltimore is no different from any urban um, environment where you have a lot of different health disparities and social determinants of health. Um, some of examples are, are listed up there. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can be working on and um, organizations that you can be working with that are focusing on these, these areas. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have about 100 different community-based organizations. They all focus on um, the broad social determinants of health. So, you know, you might be working with a public school, um, a mental health organization. Um, you might even be tutoring or mentoring, um, but all of these are related to public health in some way. Um, and so this is just kind of some, some examples of the organizations, uh, of the type of organizations we work with. Um, you can look at our website for an actual directory of the specific organizations um, and to learn more about who we partner with. Um, some of the volunteer opportunities, I, it, we have a ton of volunteer opportunities, and they really range from one-time day of service activities to long-term um, projects that, that span an entire academic year. Um, so you might actually do your practicum with a Baltimore City organization. Um, and then also um, we have short-term projects, and we also support academic courses. So you might be taking courses where there's a service learning component, and so you're actually getting out and working with a, a community-based organization as a part of that course. Um, some source events um, that we have, and I'm not going to go through each of these, but a couple of the big ones are the annual community involvement fair, which happens in September. Um, and this is where we have a bunch of organizations come in one room and you can talk to the, um, the representatives and learn about what they do and find out how to get involved. We have Baltimore Week, which is a, in October, which is a great way to learn about um, Baltimore. We have we sponsor speakers and events that you know that engage you all in um, in that. And, and learning more about Baltimore. And then we also have National Volunteer Week that's actually coming up in a couple weeks um, in April um, where we have a lot of different events, another day of service, um, and a bunch of other um, events and programs that go on throughout that academic year. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to be out at the, the Student Involvement Fair later this afternoon, so I highly recommend talking to us if you have any more questions. Um, but the best way to, to learn about what we're doing um, is to email us and to get on our weekly service group. So we send out a weekly newsletter. Um, so just email us at source at jhsph.edu. You can do that right now on your phone if you'd like. Um, and you can find out what we have kind of going on on a weekly basis. And then we also have a great Facebook page and connect with us on all the other social media um, places. All right. So let's talk about Baltimore. So first about me. I am not originally from Baltimore. I'm from Washington State originally. I'm a, I'm a transplant. I've been here for a couple years, especially when I, I, I came specifically for this job. And from the moment that I moved here, and I'd been away from, um, from my home for, you know, at least the Northwest for about 10 years. And so this is the first time I've actually really felt at home somewhere. And I hope, you know, I hope that, um, and I hear that a lot actually from a lot of the students that, that come here. Um, even if they're here for just a couple years or just the one year they're here, they really feel at home. So let me just do a little poll. How many of you are from Baltimore? Oh, good, we have a few of you. How many of you have been to Baltimore prior to applying to this program? Oh, good, a number of you, that's excellent. So a few things to know about um, Baltimore. I'm going to talk through some of this, um, some of this stuff. Um, and we'll have a group of students come and talk about living in Baltimore, specifically about housing and the neighborhoods that they've lived in. So first thing to think about is um, Balmerese. It's the local dialect. And so I had to learn this when I came here. And so you might have to as well. So the term Balmer actually is Baltimore. And Merlin. That's Maryland, the state we live in. Um, you might hear people say in the summertime, I go, I'm going down the ocean. Means it's summertime vacation destination to ocean cities are going down to the ocean. So some things to know about. You could say that as well. Um, Hun, you're going to hear Hun a lot. I, know, I don't know if any of you have, have um, been able to make it up to Hamden, but you're going to see um, a lot of Hun paraphernalia. Um, it's a friendly Baltimore greeting. It it's, it's, comes from the word honey. Um, I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's used a lot in Baltimore. Um, it's a part of embracing Baltimore's hidden funk. Um, as I mentioned, Hamden, they have an annual Hun Fest. Um, and you can see this picture up here. These ladies are all probably participating in, um, in the Beehive Hun contest. And so you know, you'll see a lot of cat eye glasses and, and um, beehives. Pretty fun. Um, uh, some other balmeries um, to know, especially since you're on the health professional campuses, ambulance, that's a vehicle that takes people to the hospital. Um, arn, it's what you do with wrinkled clothes. Um, Warsh, what we do with dirty clothes. I have to say they actually say that in Washington State, too. A lot of my family calls it Washington. Um, 
the O's or the Oreos, um, that's our local baseball team, the Orioles. Um, Jeet, have you eaten yet? <laughs> So some things to, uh, to remember when you're coming here. Um, we have a lot of famous Baltimoreans as well. And I know that um, Mindy, our, uh, our director, was it yours? <laughs> Uh, so we have a lot of famous Baltimoreans, um, and Mindy, our director who usually gives this talk, um, always gets emails afterwards and says that, well, you're missing this person, this person. So this is not an exhaustive list. There are a ton of famous people from Baltimore. Um, some of them include John Waters and Barry Levinson, the filmmakers, and so that's actually where kind of that that um, the the embrace of the Hun culture and, and that part of Baltimore and Hamden um, is you'll see in, in Hairspray. Um, Kwesi Mfume, the former CEO of NAACP. Um, you have Monique, the um, award-winning actress. Cal Ripken Jr. You have Olympian Michael Phelps. Um, and the list goes on. Um, some local leaders, uh, we have, this is just something to think, uh, to, to familiarize yourself with when you're coming here. We have Martin O'Malley, the governor, Anthony Brown, the lieutenant governor, um, the mayor, Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, the city council president, Jack Young, and then um, the health center, or the um, health commissioner, Oxides, Dr. Oxides Barbeau, um, she's actually, I believe, leaving back to, to go to New York, so we'll be having somebody new um, here. But I mention these folks because um, because they often come to this campus and students actually have an opportunity to engage with local leaders, um, to learn about and, and talk with um, health disparities in, in relation to politics. And so um, it's, it's something really um, valuable that we have here at Hopkins and great resources such as these, as these local leaders. So living in Baltimore, I know all of you are wondering how to get around here. Um, there are a lot of ways to get around, um, especially when associated with Hopkins, because we have the, the Homewood um, JHMI shuttle, which operates year-round um, between the Homewood campus in Charles Village and the Johns Hopkins Medical Campus. So it goes right, um, right in front of the, of the hospital. Um, and then we have the Eastern Campus Shuttle, which is over, um, Eastern Campus is over in the Waverly neighborhood, and, and we'll be talking more about neighborhoods so you can familiarize yourself later. Um, and that goes to the Homewood Campus and to the medical campus here. Um, Mount Washington Green, Being, Green Spring Station. There are also a couple of, of shuttles that just kind of go locally, especially if you live down in Fells Point or Butchers Hill, you can take, take a shuttle up, up um, to the medical campus as well. And then you have the College Town sh shuttles that run between Homewood, camp the Homewood campus, Goucher College, and Towson areas, so some of our other local, our local universities. Um, some other ways to get around are the metro and light rail, rail system. So we have, we do have a subway. It has only one line, so it's very convenient for those of you who live, um, maybe live outside the city or um, live on, in the part of the city that has the metro. Um, we have, we're very close to, uh, Penn Station is just in downtown Baltimore, and we're very close to D.C. and New York, and this is how the, the transfer point to get, take the MARC train, which is the commuter train between D.C. and Baltimore, and the Amtrak tra trains to get anywhere really um, on the East Coast. And we have a lot of bus lines, um, we have a free um, Charm City circulator, which has three lines, um, which is really valuable. BWI Airport is only about 20 minutes from, a 20 minute car ride from um, from Baltimore. It's, it's nice and convenient. There are water taxis, zip cars, um, transportation is plentiful, and we have a lot of students that come here without cars and are able to get around conveniently. Um, some other great aspects of Baltimore are the galleries and museums. We have some really fun and unique um, museums, and there's a really vibrant local art scene. Um, the American Visionary Art Museum is one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, um, it's definitely a unique way of, of expressing art. Um, but we also have the Walters Gallery and the Baltimore Museum of Art. Those last two are actually free, and they're pretty amazing. They are, as from folks that I know in the art community, crown jewels of Baltimore. Um, there are a lot of ways to learn about the history, not only of Baltimore, but of the United States. Baltimore is really the center of, uh, of, of American history, and so there are a lot of places to learn about that, such as Fort McHenry and, um, and other places, uh, other museums and um, monuments around the city. 
we have a lot of theaters and concert venues, um, and you can see pretty much anything. You can see, you know, people like the Avid Brothers, or groups like the Avid Brothers at the Pier 6 Concert Pavilion. Um, you also have other big names. Um, a lot of classic rock groups come to Pier 6. Um, but you can also see local, locally produced or more independently produced um, films and, and productions at the Creative Alliance at the Patterson. That's actually not too far from here near Patterson Park. Um, and you um, and the Hippodrome has um, nationally known um, Broadway productions. Like we just recently had um, the Book of Mormon here, which is pretty cool. Um, we have some very unique community-oriented activities, some things that you're not going to see anywhere else in the country. One of those is the kinetic sculpture race by the American Visionary Art Museum. You can see the picture of the big fluffy dog there. That is a um, pedal-powered race, an obstacle course. Um, so all these, these human-built sculptures are um, racing around the city um, on pedals, and you'll have bikes. It's pretty, it's pretty hilarious, and that happens in the spring. And then um, at Christmas, you can see Hamden's Miracle on 34th Street, and that's the picture below where um, all of 34th Street in Hamden is just alight with um, crazy lights and decorations, some of it kitschy, some of it really artsy, like a, um, a hubcap Christmas tree. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. And here's a list of all the other cool and unique community-oriented community activities. Um, for shopping, there's plenty of shopping. I know a lot of you are going to be thinking more about where to get your food, where do I need to get all of my um, accessories. So we've got a lot of, we have, we've got the basics like Target and Ikea, Whole Foods. Um, the most recent opening is Canton Crossing, which has a Target, and um, they'll have a Harris Teeter opening soon. And for those of you who, li who will live in Canton or, or Fells Point, um, this is a very convenient um, uh, shopping area. But there's also um, more independent shopping areas where you have specialty stores, boutiques, antiques, Mount Vernon, Charles Village, Brewers Hill, um, Hamden's, the Avenue. Um, there's just a lot to do as far as shopping goes. And food and dining. There is some awesome food here in Baltimore, and I'm still discovering all these neighborhood gems. And so um, one of the best resources to find out where to eat in Baltimore is through Baltimore Magazine's um, best restaurants issues, and they'll have they'll have all of those on their website. Um, it's you know there are just new new restaurants popping up here and there, and also there are, there are restaurants that are unique to the neighborhood. So when you get here, explore your neighborhood, find the little hole in the walls. Um, you pretty much have everything. Um, obviously, Baltimore, being by the bay, specializes in seafood. You can get picking crabs and and uh, mussels. I mean, if for seafood lovers, this is a great place to live. Um, also to note are the municipal food markets, um, the largest of which is the Lexington Market, which is actually the oldest and uh, longest continually running public market in the country. Um, and um, there are a number of other markets. One, which is just three blocks, two or three blocks from here, called the Northeast Market, um, where you can get prepared foods, you can get produce, you can get um, fresh seafood. Um, and it, they're really, I mean, they're, they're really a part of the vibrant neighborhoods and the communities in Baltimore. So I highly recommend checking out the Northeast Market even today if you can, um, or you know, next time when you come back to Baltimore. And then there are a ton of fruit, food trucks around the city as well, and you're going to see some of them here um, at the Baltimore campus or at the Hopkins campus. Um, they usually have one pretty much every day um, around here. Um, sports are huge here in Baltimore. Um, you have uh, you have you know Johns Hopkins Blue Jay sports, but you also have the Orioles and the Ravens. Um, that picture on the bottom is from the Super Bowl um, last year. Mindy Levin, our director, is a huge Ravens fan and went to the Super Bowl, so she had to have that up there as well. Um, and so you can also get involved in sports yourself if you you know play soccer or um, or touch football. Um, you know, you, you can check out the county and city recreation councils, Baltimore sports and social clubs. There are plenty of ways to get involved in sports yourself. Uh, Baltimore is a, a great place geographically because it's kind of right mid um, in the center of the East Coast. And so you can easily take trains to Washington, D.C., New York, Philadelphia. Um, there's also a lot of outdoors activities to do not far away. You have the Cunningham Falls State Park, Catoctin Mountain National Park. Um, so it's a really great place geographically to be living. 
some housing resources. I know that's probably the first thing you're going to be thinking about when you accept um, accept your Hopkins, um, accept Hopkins, whatever it is. <laughs> um, so one resource is the uh, JHMI housing office. The rest of these resources have, have been the most popular among students. And actually, Craigslist is, is a is um, very popular. And you're going to hear from the students um, about where they um, want to find, um, or where they found housing and where their colleagues have found housing. Um, I do want to point out some of the neighborhoods that students tend to live in because they're either on a shuttle stop or they're in walking distance or close proximity to campus. Um, you have Charles Village and Mount Vernon, which are both on the shuttle lines. Um, Fells Point, Canton, and Patterson Park are within walking, biking distance, and there are some shuttles that come from those areas. Um, but really, it's, I live in Butchers Hill, which is just north of Fells Point and it's a 15-minute walk here, which is really great. Um, and there's also public transportation available um, to commuting to and from the counties as well. Um, you also might be looking for places of worship. Here are a couple of resources for that. Child care for those who are bringing your families with you. And then there are a number of parks in Baltimore, so if you're interested in living near green space, check out um, Patterson Park, Federal Hill Park, Riverside Park, and Fort McHenry Park. Um, some other uh, resources and information about Baltimore um, are some of these websites. I want to point out what Weekly is a, is a newer um, online magazine and has a weekly, it, it'll send you, they'll send you a weekly update on what's going on in Baltimore that week. So that's a great resource also. So um, I believe all of the students are here. So I'm going to hand it over to Leslie and, and the students. And um, I look forward to seeing you all when you come here next year. I'm going to invite our students to come on up and have a seat on these lovely stools. Um, I do want to make note of a few things real quick. In your packet, you're going to see a map like this um, that will just kind of help us talk through some of the different neighborhoods. Um, where's... The little fancy blue star that you can see, <laughs> um, that is actually where we are right now. That's the Hopkins campus. Um, and then the red lines that are going um, north to south, um, that is Charles Street. And then the one that is going east to west, um, that is Baltimore Street. And that's kind of a good way to look at the city when you're um, talking about the different areas. There's kind of northwest, northeast, um, and so forth. So I'm going to do my best to point out the neighborhoods as our students talk about them. But this time is for you. Um, you can ask questions about anything, about housing, about life. Um, we have four students represented here. I've also lived in Baltimore City for six years. And now I had children and moved out in the county. So so if there's any families, um, I'm happy to talk through with that stuff as well, um, and we can do it afterwards also. So who has a good question? Oh, I'm sorry. You need mics. Yep, you can use those mics. You guys can go ahead. Or should we? Do, let's introduce ourselves. Yeah. Why don't we go through and you say what your name is, where you're from, um, what, de what degree, to what department that you're in, um, and, and where you live, what neighborhood you live in. My name is Max. Uh, I also live in Charles Village. I think we might even live on the same street, but uh, Guilford. Um, I'm a medical student at Hopkins uh, doing my full-time MPH. This year, I'm also customizing. I'm interested in primary care health systems. Um, I moved, so I moved here to start medical school three and a half years ago um, and found a place on Craigslist, and I've stayed in Charles Village ever si since. I moved one block north on, on Guilford Avenue. I was born in uh, Berea. That's where I grew up. Oh, cool. I can actually use this. Sweet. Okay. I was born in Berea, and now I live in Elwell Park. So, as you can see, I haven't gone far. <laughs> um, I'm a first-year PhD student in the uh, mental health department. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to your questions. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm in the full-time MPH program. 
concentrating in social and behavioral sciences. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. Before coming here, I did a stint in Peace Corps in Nicaragua. And I'm currently living in Upper Fells, which is really close to the school. You can walk here. the fun duty of repeating your question. Um, so I'm just letting the panelists know as well. So let's go ahead and open up the floor. Who has the best first question? Nobody. There we go. Don't be shy. Yeah, back there. Okay, so the question is, what do you wish that you would have been told coming into Baltimore or to Johns Hopkins? Can I ask a clarifying question? You mean related to what neighborhood to live in? <laughs> His response was just anything. <laughs> uh, Why don't we? Yeah. Uh, okay. As far as coming to Baltimore, now granted. I'm from here, so I'll have a little bit of, of a different perspective, but it's a very friendly city. How many of you have seen The Wire? <laughs> oh God, okay. <laughs> I'm telling you now, get that out of your head. Seriously. That's only the west side, not the east side. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously though, I mean, every major city has its problems. Baltimore is no exception. I will agree with that, but that, shouldn't characterize the entire city because it's just not true. A lot of people are very friendly. They will say hello. They will ask you how you're doing. Do not be shocked by this. <laughs> just give them an answer. <laughs> That's all you have to do, and, and you can move on your merry way. So be prepared to interact with other human beings <laughs> if you come to Baltimore. <laughs> as far as Hopkins, the one thing I would say that I wish I had known is that despite this being the best public health school in the world, it's not very competitive. And that's a good thing. You know, people aren't at, at each other's throats to, to claw their way to the top. They're willing to work with each other, to collaborate, to cooperate. You know, it, it's a very friendly environment, and yet you still receive a lot of accolades and you still accomplish a lot. So if you come here, relax. Seriously, just get your work done. You're going to meet a lot of great people with a lot of brilliant ideas, and they'll actually want to work with you, <laughs> you know, and, and not want to, you know, keep you down, you know, with a boot on your throat, and not allow you to grow and to progress and things like that. So you'd be quite surprised if you come here how, how relaxed it is. Yeah. That's great. I, I like how you answer that. Uh, I'll answer sort of in the same way in terms of coming to Baltimore. Something that I was really pleased by is it's, it's a city, so it has everything – many of the things that cities have to offer, but it's also a very small city. And it's amazing, after just a year of being here, I felt like everywhere I go, I, I run into somebody I know, um, which is sort of fun. Um, and then for coming to Hopkins, along the same, same lines, uh, don't be afraid to ask any faculty member um, to learn about their work. The, the truth is, it's an enormous school um, with a lot of faculty who are doing a lot of different things. And every time I've just emailed out of the blue some faculty member, um, to say I'm interested in your work, I might be interested in working on a project with you. They've been really inviting because they're genuine. No matter if they're a MacArthur Genius Grant awardee or uh, whatever, you know, whatever um, accomplishments, a dean or a chair of a department, they're they're genuinely pleased that students are interested in their work. Um, and there are honestly a lot of faculty members and and relatively not that many students knocking on their doors. So don't be scared to reach out and just just introduce yourself. Ladies, or <laughs> well, I think they answered quite eloquent, eloquently. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, trying to think, I'll just reiterate some of the things that they said. That everyone is really friendly. One of my favorite things about living in Baltimore is that, well, I'll preface this by reminding you guys that I grew up outside of Boston, where no one talks to anyone, um, <laughs> and then. Um, contrasting that with, um, I came here right after finishing my Peace Corps service, so I was in a small community where you can't go from point A to point B without talking to every single person that you pass. So coming to Baltimore was a really nice, happy medium where, <laughs> where I can chat with people. I actually know my neighbors. 
Um, and it's just, it feels really, really community oriented being here, which I like. And then reaching out to faculty, yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I can't add too much more to what everyone else has said, but um, I would also, just in terms of like practical logistics, things that might help you in your life if you do choose to come here. Um, I think for me, I am not a type A personality as much as I thought I was. Um, I think, you know, getting down a routine where you take care of your daily life activities before you start a program here would be great because it's very fast paced because we have eight week terms here instead of semesters. Um, so if you're used to a semester system, I think adjusting to that, there is a little bit of a transition adjustment period there. Um, so kind of making sure that if you, you know, if you like to have exercise in your schedule on a regular basis, then make sure that you have that down you know, like planning your meals, stuff like that, just daily things that will make your life a lot easier and making sure you have a sleep like sleep schedule and routine down. It'll help you a lot as well. Great. Next question in the red coat. Sure, the question was to talk about the neighborhoods that these students live in, kind of what the feeling is about it, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Can you all see this? Yep. Yeah. Can you all see this fancy laser pointer? Yeah. Okay. That's so what I'll, be I'll go first. I live in Charles Village, up here. Um, things I like about it is uh, there's a lot of sort of family-oriented neighborhood, um, a lot of people hanging out on the street, meeting each other. I, I have a small, a uh, young child, um, so having other parents around is really fun. Um, it's really accessible on the free shuttle bus, and it's also accessible to a lot of great parks. I love to run with my dog, so there's a great park over here and over around the lake over here, and there's another lake over there and this big <laughs> park. So there's a lot of great parks. Um, and it's also relatively safe and relatively, at least in my opinion, relatively affordable considering the safety. You know, if you, you sort of, looking at different neighborhoods, you're sort of weighing these different factors. Um, and for, for my standards, it's sort of like the cheapest safe neighborhood that I wanted to live in. Um, and things that I don't like so much about it is there's not a ton of locally owned sort of independent businesses, bars and restaurants. It's right next to the college campus, so there's like Chipotle and uh, a lot of businesses that cater to college students, um, but not uh, in like, you know, college bars, but not other places that I like to spend time. So I found myself going to Mount Vernon and uh, Hamden and other neighborhoods to go out in the evenings on the weekends. So I also live in Charles Village, and I guess we live on the same street, which I just found out. Um, but um, it has a year-round farmer's market, if you like that. Um, it's within walking distance from pretty much all parts of Char Charles Village. I live in the southernmost edge, um, right there towards the bottom, um, and it's still within walking distance. Um, and it's close to the Homewood undergraduate campus, so there's a fabulous library there if you like to study in a library setting. Um, and even if it gets late, they have shuttles that run from 5 p.m. till past midnight, so it'll drop you off at your door pretty much, um, and that's a great perk. It's a very bike-friendly neighborhood. Um, Guilford Avenue is actually a bike boulevard that was recently made into a bike boulevard. Um, what else? The grocery shopping and everything is, in, is within walking distance. Um, and I think, as Max said, it's a bit more affordable than some of the more conventional neighborhoods where um, a lot of Hopkins students tend to live, like Mount Vernon and Fells. Um, also pet-friendly, yeah, I think you covered that. Okie dokie. Um, again, I live in Elwood Park now. Why did I choose Elwood Park? Well, that's where my girlfriend lives. <laughs> so I just follow her. <laughs> um, the pros, it's quiet. Uh, it can be lively when it gets warmer. Uh, the cons, uh, if you want to get fresh food, kind of a problem, but that speaks to a bigger issue that I can talk about later if you want me to. But, <laughs> but it, it's not far away uh, from areas where you can't get fresh food. I mean, a lot of things are very, very close. So if you want to make the effort, you know, it's not going to be too much of an effort to do so. Um, if you want to go party, you can go to Fells Point, and you can actually walk back. I did that before when the Ravens won the Super Bowl. I was partying down on Broadway, and I just ended up walking back to my house. It was so much fun. <laughs> um, but proximity, proximity to the school, I think from my, from my house to the school, I can walk in less than 30 minutes. 
but I'm lazy, so I'll take my car and drive up like 10 blocks and then walk <laughs> from there. <laughs> um, parks everywhere. Uh, but the biggest thing, no matter what neighborhood you really choose, proximity, as you can see, they're all so close. I, I call downtown the epicenter. That's that's the epicenter of the city. All close, all close. Um, I'm not sure as to housing that's actually available where I am. It is more residential, so houses and places to stay may be harder to come by, but it is something to, to look into. All right, so I live in Upper Fells Point. Yeah, right there. Um, the reason why I chose it is because I really love the flexibility of being able to walk to school. Um, and so I walk every day to and from class. It's about a 12 minute walk, it's so close. And then I also chose it because I have a dog and if you can see the giant green on the map, Patterson Park, I go there like two to three times a day and it's great to get outside and, and walk around and she likes it too. <laughs> Um, and then the other great thing about Fells is that it's close to, it's, so it's close to school, close to the, the bars, and close to the park. But <laughs> what else you that's what I needed when I was looking for housing. So <laughs> no, but it's it's great because people have social events and it's always close by. I can just walk there and then I can walk back and do the rest of my homework. So it's um it's a really convenient place to live. And then. In terms of affordability, I, I live with two other students in a row home, and it's pretty affordable. And there are a, a lot of rentals around. There are a lot of students that live in my neighborhood. So it's good. Great. Next question. Right here. The question is, do you feel like most people that you know live in row homes or apartments? Um, I think it depends what people are looking for. Um, there are definitely options to do both. Um, in my neighborhood, it's, m well, there's actually a mix. So there are a lot of row homes, but then there are also a lot of row homes that have been converted into apartments. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really whatever you're looking for, you can get. I know a lot of students live in the 929 building, which is um, just like a block or two away from school. And a lot of people like that for the convenience, but row homes are, generally a little bit more affordable than big apartment buildings like that. Yeah, I agree. I think generally speaking, row homes are a little more affordable. Um, though, I mean, Baltimore is pretty affordable overall, so it's not a huge difference that you'd see. Um, and I think, as Max was just saying, it depends on what neighborhood you want to live in. I think in Mount Vernon, it's a lot harder to find a row home. It's mostly apartments. Um, places like Charles Village or Fells, I think it's a lot easier to find a row home. And it also depends, you know, how many people you're comfortable living with. Um, if you, like, I live in a five-bedroom row home, so I have four housemates, but it's really big, so there's lots of space, and we never feel like we're cramped. Um, but if you are the type of person who prefers to have, you know, a lot of your own space that you're not sharing with too many other people, then, you know, apartment's better, yeah. If you get a chance uh, to walk around the building, I know they kind of keep you on a tight schedule. Check the walls. There are a lot of postings for housing uh, in the city, and that'll give you a good idea as to how much it costs and how much space you'd actually have. I was actually just kind of looking around the wall because I was bored. <laughs> and I saw qu quite a bit of postings, and, and they were very affordable. And, you know, a lot of row houses, which, yeah, there's a lot of row houses in Baltimore, but like she said, a lot have been converted to appeal to students. So they've been converted into apartment-style domiciles, so to speak. So, but yeah, but I, you, whatever you want, basically, is kind of the answer. If you want a, a traditional apartment, you can find it. If you want a row home that's been converted to an apartment, you can find it. If you want a true row home, you can find it. I, I would just add, I'd probably guess it's probably about 50-50 in terms of students, where, where they choose to live, mm -hmm. uh, apartments and row houses. I'm not sure if you, any of you have had an experience with the housing website, um, but they, we are going to be sending all of our admitted students an email within the next week um, about the housing resources. They have a really great website that they just recently kind of implemented a few years ago um, that can, you can really look at housing and, and see what's available and also possibly match roommates. Um, there's also a housing fair for anybody who's local. Um, it's going to be April 17th, um, but we'll send you all email to information about that as well to help you f kind of figure out the neighborhoods. Next question, over there. Um, 
that's a good question. The question was, are there any neighborhoods that you would recommend not going to or walking through and things like that? And in all honesty, it's really, it's a preference. Um, it's what your comfort level is. And we have some students that are coming from the Midwestern states who may not be used to as many much city living. Um, and it's what you what you kind of feel comfortable in. Um, we don't like to necessarily that there, say that there's not, there's good and bad neighborhoods because somebody may live in a neighborhood that I may not prefer um, and vice versa. Um, so there's certainly areas, I mean, all of our students choose different areas. And I think felt we kind of hit the big student areas where students live, Fells Point, Upper Fells, um, Butcher's Hill is great, Charles Village is a hot one, and so is Mount Vernon. Um, and then students like David choose to live right by campus as well because it's, it's within walking distance. So it's about preference. It's hard for us to say, well, that one's good, that one's not. Um, it's not like that. Yeah, you guys I, have anything to add? I would just add, you know, I'm sure other people here would agree that um, uh, it's not a matter of neighborhoods that you never want to go to. It's under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, is it alone in the middle of the night on a weekend or is it during the day with some friends uh, walking through? And, the, and so there's, that's a big difference, you know, and that's something that you'll, you'll get the sense for different neighborhoods. Uh, but I would agree. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, suffice it to say, most students live in Charles Village, Mount Vernon, sort of around Patterson Park and near campus. Um, Anybody else? Um, yeah, I just want to add when I was doing research about um, moving to Baltimore, the city of Baltimore, I think it's the city of Baltimore, has a website or maybe it's Baltimore Tourism, whatever it is, and it's like, what neighborhood is best for you? And you fill out a quiz and it tells you what neighborhood fits your personality. <laughs> Done. So there, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Live Baltimore. I get what you're saying. And honestly, I could tell you the answers, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'll just kind of put it in a general sense. It's not as bad as you think, and as long as you use your common sense, you'll be fine. Oh. Also, just wanted to add that I think regardless of where you live, um, one thing that I have found, actually, I've done a lot of um, community organizing on the west side, um, which upon first impression, I was terrified that I would have to work there, um, but it's been the most rewarding experience ever because of the people that I've met and getting to know people there has made me realize that my initial impressions of safety and concerns about that are, like it's, it's just a first impression. Like if you build relationships with people, Baltimore is like a small town, even though it's a large city, people will really look out for you and um, I think you'll realize that there's a lot more to it than you know what you may initially perceive. All right, next question. How about way back there? You, yep, you. <laughs> oh, then you're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheap here. <laughs> The question is about can you define affordability? What is it like to, li what are costs associated with living in a row home or an apartment, things like that? Um, so my row home costs 2000 a month and I share it with two other students. So three of us in the row home. I chose the bigger room with its own bathroom. So I pay a little bit more, $50 a month more. Um, so I pay 700 and they both pay 650 a month and then plus utilities which vary um, higher in the winter, just like everywhere. Um, but yeah, so that, I found that to be affordable, especially when hearing how much other people pay for places in, in like New York and DC. <laughs> okay, um, so I also live in a row home. Um, I, as I mentioned, I live with four other people, so I think my rent is probably on the very low end of what, among what students here pay. I pay 515 a month. Um, I know that there are, and I, so I live in Charles Village, which is full of row homes, um, but I know that there's, I have a friend who lives in Upper Fells also, and she lives in a three bedroom, and she's paying less than 500 a month. So it's, it's not even like determined necessarily by neighborhood. You can find great deals. I've found Craigslist to be great. And also, uh, if you do plan on coming here, join the Facebook group um, for your cohort, for your program. A lot of people, will, a lot of outgoing students will post things on there. Um, and if you act fast, you can get a really great deal. Um, I think uh, with, in terms of the average price for like a room in a row home, I think it would probably between, be between six and eight hundred. Um, I think apartments will usually start at around eight hundred, maybe a, a 
a few may start around like 750-ish um, and go up from there. I know um, I have a couple of friends who live in Mount Vernon. One has a one bedroom and um, she lives there with her fiance. She's paying maybe like around 1200 or so. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a better idea. Yeah. yeah, when I first moved here, I lived in a pretty big three bedroom row home with some other people and the whole house was 1900. Now I live in a similarly sized three bedroom row home that I own and we rent out rooms for about 550 or 500 and 550, which I think is a pretty good deal. Um, and, and I have a friend who's moving here to start nursing school and I was just spending a lot of time on Craigslist yesterday. First of all, they've really improved the map interface on Craigslist. It's way better than it used to be. Um, and then second of all, she's looking for two bedrooms, sort of in similar neighborhoods to where we live, um, uh, two bedroom houses, two or three bedroom. And she was, and it seemed like she was finding a lot in the 11 to $1,300 range. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some numbers. Just to add to when I about a few years or five years ago or so in Fells Point, I was able to get a house for eight hundred dollars, two bedroom, two full bath, rooftop deck. It was rehabbed. Now, granted, it was a little wider than this. <laughs> it was no, it wasn't that bad, but it was real. It was small, but it was just my husband and I, and it worked out. Eight hundred bucks a month um, was pretty pretty good. Okay, next question. Yeah. You can flip over your map, and you see a map of the shuttle route. <laughs> I'll let you guys answer it. The question was, um, this student has an apartment in Mount Vernon, but was curious as to um, the what the shuttle is like and the reliability and things like that. Yeah, I say, I mean, uh, I, I mostly bike, but I also take the shuttle some. Um, uh, Google Next Bus. JHMI, and that'll tell you when the next bus is coming. You put in your stop which direction you're going. Um, in the mornings, they run like every 10 minutes around, and in the evenings, like around commuting times, and then they run less frequently in the middle of the day and late at night, um, more like every half hour, 15 minutes to half hour, maybe really late, they go like every hour. Uh, but they have a schedule online. Um, but in terms of reliability, they do run pretty punctually on time. Occasionally, uh, like if the weather's really bad, they'll be like overfilled and you'll have to wait till the next bus, um, which can be a little frustrating when you're trying to get to school. But if, it's, uh, if, if, it, if that's the case, sometimes they send out extra buses more than are on the schedule. Um, but that next bus, they have a phone uh, thing, app, um, where you can see the next bus arrives in two minutes. I know it takes me a minute and a half to get to the bus stop so I can leave my house now, which is really nice, especially if it's like raining. Um, and I think uh, specifically for the Mount Vernon stop, especially during rush hour times, um, I would suggest that you avoid the rush hour times if at all possible, get to school a little earlier, or if you don't have class in the morning, like come a little bit later because I live in Charles Village, so I like sometimes my stop, which is 27th Street, it gets full, and the next stop is Penn Station, and a few people get off, but then the next one after that is Mount Vernon, and it's usually there's a long line of people waiting in Mount Vernon because so many people live there, and they get past, like two or three buses can go by sometimes during rush hour, so um, it's a pretty popular stop. So if you do end up living in that neighborhood, make sure that you take that into account. Okay, next question right here. The question was, biking, how is it? Well, I don't know if this will apply to everybody, so we can talk more afterwards. But um, it depends on what you're used to. So I've biked in a lot of cities and a lot of rural areas and stuff. And I think Baltimore is pretty good for biking because it's small. Um, a lot of things fall in that distance range of like two to three miles where uh, you can get places a lot quicker by biking and actually quicker by biking than um, driving um, because you don't have to worry about parking. Um, there are a lot of potholes. Um, and people run red lights more here than any other city I've ever been in. Um, so you have to be aware of those things. So, you know, there aren't a ton of bike lanes, so it's, uh, there are certain streets like Guilford Avenue, which are good, um, and certain areas that have bike lanes, and certain, like, parks that are really great for biking with families, but for biking, for getting around, um, you have to be comfortable with cars, biking around cars. Um, and I will say, people jaywalk more aggressively in Baltimore than anywhere I've ever been. I, I'm talking New York, L.A., I mean, places where people are proud of their jaywalking. People in Baltimore. And I have this theory that drivers expect at any moment a person to jump out in front of them. So they actually have pretty good situational awareness. And I feel like I benefit from that as a biker because people are like aware of what's going on. Um, but that said, you know, you have to be aware that people may run red lights. I can definitely attest to that. It's as if they'll walk any time and they are ruthless about it, man. They will look at you like, you're wrong. Even though you clearly have the green light. And I've always had this theory and I shouldn't probably say it on the mic. So are there any lawyers? 
<laughs> anyone, anyone want to? I'm gonna need to talk to you because I have a theory. I want you to. I want to. I want to test this theory out with you. But yeah, definitely be mindful of jaywalkers. I don't even know if you really call them jaywalkers. I just call them walkers. Do whatever the hell they want, walkers, really. And yeah, drivers. Uh, we are kind of crazy drivers here in Baltimore. I will. I will attest to that. <laughs> and in terms of choosing routes that are safe, I mean, I do bike different places if I'm biking, commuting home late at night versus coming in the middle of the day. So we can talk more about that. And there are a lot of bikers, especially in school public, they've covered bike parking in the basement, which is really secure, which is nice. So anyway. Yes, that's a bonus. <laughs> right here in our building. Uh, how about in the turquoise top? Yes. <laughs> the question is about walking and the frequency of walk walkability. Is that even a fair statement? <laughs> and then also, what is it like to have a car here? Uh, go ahead, David. <laughs> <All right. laughs> walking is not so bad. Uh, like I said, I walked from Fells Point to Elwood Park after the Super Bowl, and I was a little inebriated, but that's fine. It was okay. It was an easy walk, and it wasn't so bad. It was pretty safe for like 2, 3 in the morning. As far as parking... This city is ruthless when it comes to parking tickets. If they can find any little reason to give you a $52 parking ticket, they will do it. I can attest to this. If they can find a way to tow your car, which will cost you an extra $300, they will do it. It's happened to me twice. <laughs> I've paid them more than I've paid most people. I don't like that. <laughs> but. It can be difficult to find parking spaces and you have to pay attention to the restrictions because they they will be lurking in the shadows to see if you screwed up <laughs> and they will be so quick to give you a ticket. So depending on where you, I, I would say around, yeah, around Fells Point and around this area, it can be somewhat difficult. There's no, no lie about that. Having said that, um, I have a car and I live in Upper Fells um, and so Everyone on my street and on my block seems to commute to work every day, so I take advantage of the weird schedule that I have as a student. And as long as I'm there before 5 p.m., I can park right in front of my house, and I don't have to pay to park. There's no permit in my neighborhood. So that is really good. And, yeah, I don't know where else I was going with that. But, yeah, it's possible to have a car, and you just have to be aware of what the rules are in your neighborhood. Um, I also have a car. I think parking is really easy in Charles Village compared to a lot of other neighborhoods in particular. I've heard horror stories about Fells <laughs> and also Mount Vernon. Um, and on my street, again, there's no permit required. And apparently there's a rule in Baltimore that you're supposed to move, not have your car parked in one spot for more than two days, which I hear they actually, like in Fells, they enforce that more. Um, I've heard from other students, um, but in Charles Village, I leave, like, I went away for a month over winter break, and I left my car there, and it was totally fine. Um, and I think it does take a little bit of planning and strategizing if you want to drive your car to the more popul populated areas where parking is harder to find. Um, public transportation is pretty reliable, I found, um, so that's great. And also interesting factoid, which David might appreciate. The, uh, the Charm City Circulator is funded by parking tickets. So if you take the circulator. <laughs> feel any better. <laughs> I never use it. So. Oh, wow. But I guess it goes to I think you'll start but, using it now. Yeah, I to, Get yeah. your money back. I'll just say really, oh, really quick, um, in turn, if you're from Boston or New York or something, people play the big city parking game in Canton and Fells Point and down here where you got to like, move your car and park certain times a day. I try not to I, – I struggle going out there in the evenings, even though there's great bars and events going on, because like I don't want to have to park. Um, and then Mount Vernon, uh, moderate difficulty parking, and pretty much the rest of the oh, in downtown, moderate difficulty parking maybe during the day. But the rest of the city, parking is not hard to find. I mean, the, the population density uh, for uh, inner city is relatively low for most parts of the, the city. So. And if it's not an apartment, a lot of times row homes have parking pads um, that you can, you, it may be a part of the rent or an additional fee. All right, we have a couple more minutes. Let's get the good ones. Right there. Uh, 
question is, what is parking on campus like, and what is the commute like for anybody who's going back and forth from DC? Um, so uh, sometimes I do drive and park on campus. Um, during the day, you get a in the Washington Street garage, which is the closest one to, to this building, um, you get a $2 discount from the regular fee during regular work hours. But if you come in after 4 PM, you can park for free. So I, when I have evening classes, I drive so that it's just easier. Um, and what was the second question? Oh, DC, DC, right. Um, there are actually several students I know who live in DC in the MPH program who are commuting every day. Um, they try to schedule their classes so they have to come here fewer days during the week. Um, but there are two or three people I know who are driving. They take 95 and they do it. Um, I think it's about two and a half to three hours that they schedule every day for their commute. Um, the Mark train, in my opinion, is easier. Um, but again, you have to live close to both uh, to Union Station in DC to make it um, as short of a commute as possible. And I have a couple of friends who are doing that as well, and it's doable. There are, all, are also satellite parking lots for our students. Do you know how much it is per month? Church home is $55. Um, dollars, but you do then you'd have to take a shuttle into campus. So um, I know a lot of our students choose, as we've heard, to live near shuttle stops so that you don't have to worry about f getting finding parking on campus and dealing with that. Um, but it's it's again, it's your preference, what you'd like. Okay. Um, also, oh, go ahead. sorry, I just Max pointed out that we didn't really answer your earlier question about walkability. Um, I think that generally speaking, within neighborhood walkability is pretty high. Um, it's just sometimes between neighborhoods or the neighborhoods that are in between the more, m most heavy traffic areas, people feel a little bit more um, uncomfortable walking through. But I know people who walk anywhere and everywhere throughout the city. So I think it depends on your comfort level. OK, two more. They have to be the best two. All right, these hands are really high. Here's one. Go ahead. Wait a second, that's cheating. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the first, do you feel you need a car to get to work and that you're comfortable? And the second part is, you said there might be some trouble bumps. Um, what are the pros and cons of coming out of semester on a slower highway with no party connection versus coming out on an eight-week, five-term? OK, so the question is, well, let's do the eight-week, five, or let's do the term question first. So what is? Um, your, what is it like coming into a term system versus a semester system? Um, so yeah, so I'm a dual degree student. Um, I'm doing a master of social work at the University of Maryland as well, and they have a semester system. So I made that transition really quick coming into the MPH program in the summer. Um, I really liked that they have a summer term because it gives you kind of a little bit of a less lower stress experience where you get to transition into that system. Um, I think the pros are you get to take a lot more classes. You get to learn a lot more. Um, it forces you to be a lot more organized um, and manage your time a lot better than you ever thought you could. Um, I think the cons are it's just really a crazy pace. <laughs> um, I think that it does. It, you'll, you might be a little more stressed out than you would be if you were on a semester system. Um, but I think you know the nature of the program here, the MPH program specifically, is that it's a one-year accelerated program. So it allows you to get back into the workforce a lot faster. So I think that's a major benefit of the program. Anybody else? I would agree. Um, I was out of school for four years before I came to Hopkins. So going from a semester system back in 2009 to go into a term system in 2013 was absurd, <laughs> simply absurd. Um, it's a sprint. Yeah. It's that's the best way. To, it's a sprint, and you have to be on point because missing a day is like missing a week. Missing a week is like missing a month, and you will be lost. <laughs> I'm, I'm dealing with that now. I just had a kid last Monday, and I missed all of last week dealing with the kid. So I'm trying to catch up on from last week, which is like catching up in a month, and I have to do it in a weekend. So. There you go. <laughs> it, it can be stressful, but it, it is manageable. And if you would ever go back to a semester system, it would seem so slow. So, and so, so easy. Slow. And so easy. <laughs> and just real quick, um, do you feel like you need to have a car on campus? Go real quick. No. No. Public transportation is great. And the Charm City Circulator, buses, uh, light rail, subway, and Hopkins shuttle get you pretty much anywhere you need to go. The only time I really feel like I need a car is to get out of Baltimore and go to other places. And there's Zipcar and stuff like that here too, so that's great. Last best question. Go ahead. How do you 
Great question. How would you describe the social environment? So it's a big place uh, with a lot of people. Um, and I figure if you go to a big place with a lot of people, I mean, like, I don't know, how many students are here? Like thousands? Two thousand. Two thousand. You're going to find people that you like, OK? And you'll probably find a few that you don't particularly like. But, um, but there's 2,000 people, so you find people that you like. So I, I don't know. It probably depends on the program somewhat. MPH is sort of this intensive thing where you start out taking the same classes for an entire term. So you really get to know each other, and there's a strong social bond between those people. Yeah, and there's sort of nobody else here over the summer. Um, yeah. Real quick, real um, quick. Okay. Yeah, so during the summer, there are a lot of social events with the MPH class. So everyone gets to know each other and bond. And then my roommate is in the MSPH program, which is the two-year two year one. And so she's really close with her cohort as well. And they host, like, potlucks and things all the time. So I think you get really close with your cohort and do social things. Just to put a nice little bow on it. This place will push you to do your best academically, but they realize just doing that alone is absurd again. So they do allow a lot of opportunities to get to know the people that you're working with and the people that you're learning with. So it, it helps to build relationships, not just with the school and within the school, but the community as well, so. Right. Go ahead, real quick. OK, OK. Um, I just wanted to say um, I was very surprised with how much emphasis there actually is on the social environment here. Um, it's not just all about academics, although that is very important here. Um, it's given a lot of um, importance. There are a lot of social activities that are organized, um, a lot of networking, a lot of emphasis on networking, a lot of act activities and opportunities to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. I know you guys have more questions. <laughs> We're getting ready to now go into our departmental lunch sessions where you have the opportunity to talk with more students as well. Um, so on your agenda, you can see all of the departments are broken down with the room location. Um, so you're going to pick up your lunches in Finestone Hall, where you had breakfast this morning, um, and then you're going to take that to your, to your lunch location. Epi students, you're going to be staying put. Do not go get your lunch. You're going to stay in here and actually attend an Epi seminar. Um, your lunches will be picked up for you, and you'll get them after the seminar. HPM, health policy and management students, um, you're going to be meeting an escort that's at the Wall of Wonder, that big screen that's out in the lobby. Um, a student escort will take you down to Hampton House to go to your lunch location. MHA students, stay with me here, we good? <laughs> MHA students, you're going to be meeting right outside of the student affairs suite. Um, one of the students um, is going to be meeting you there, and you'll have lunch in the various locations throughout the building. And lastly, any mental health um, admitted students, the location right outside of E1002, the student affairs suite, is where you'll meet your escort to take you down to Hampton House. Campus tours will be this afternoon after your department lunches. You also have a personal walking tour in your packet. Um, if you've come to a previous campus tour, you attended one with us on Friday afternoons, it's going to be the same tour of just the building that we're, that we're giving out. Um, but you're certainly welcome to join us again. Um, the info fair will be in the lobby, right where you picked up your registration packet. You'll have the opportunity to meet with various student support offices. And then how many of you are going to join us for the reception? It's going to be good. Come on by. It's going to be a lot of people. Um, it's going to be right out here in the Wall of Wonder area. Um, you'll see everything set up. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and see ya. Hope we see you guys in a couple months. <laughs>